Ms. Hernandez, can you hear me okay? I can, Commissioner Will. Thank you very much. Got the chance to meet your husband the other day. He seemed like a great guy. He, he is, or I wouldn't have married him. <laughs> yeah, he is. Thank you.
Mr. McNeely, this is Chair Aunt Tavares. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Chair Aunt Tavares, yeah, this is Jess McNeely with staff. Hear you perfectly fine. How do you hear All me? All right. All right. Thank you. And I can hear you too. So in a couple of minutes, we'll start our study session. We should be ready to go. Okay. Thanks. That's how the most superficial answer is coming in front of you. All right, Mr. McNeely, this is Chair Aunt Tavares. It is four o'clock p.m. So if you would please start our study session. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I've just shared my screen. So we've pulled up your uh, study session agenda um, to all the commissioners present. And I see five as of right now. Um, uh, and I just admitted, I just saw uh, Commissioner Best was entering the waiting room. So we now have we now have six. We now have a quorum with six of the Planning and Zoning Commissioners. Um, welcome to your study session for today, June 28th. Um, and here is your agenda. Uh, we're going to kick off with bringing to you items that will be on future public hearings. Uh, first item that we would anticipate uh, that would be on your public hearing for next month's public hearing on July 26, 23, would be uh, sub 2247. Um, that would be a subdivision preliminary plat uh, to amend um, conditions from a previous preliminary plat approval. Uh, Bob Short with our staff is managing this case. And he's got a presentation where he can um, he can give you an overview of what's being requested. So, Bob, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, and um, uh, and we can we can discuss this first item. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Uh, Marty, I've, I believe we need to. It, it indicates that I am not able to share my screen mm -hmm. right now. Says host disabled participant screen sharing. Hmm. I've given that to you just twice. Uh, so hopefully nothing is happening here. Are you able to do it? There it goes. Thank okay. you. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. This case is one you have seen before couple of times if you've been here for a while, it's Ranch at the Peak Subdivision Preliminary Plat. And I have some uh, explanation to give as I go along for this. Uh, so in this case, the uh, property owner is Cygnus SBL Peaks LLC of Atlanta, Georgia. Representative is uh, Kent Hoss, Hodson Pillar of Mogollon Engineering here in Flagstaff. And the zoning is RR2.5 size of the this particular Parcel. This particular area is the entire subdivision, which is 185 acres. 
So this is a new request, and I'll ex explain that in a minute, but I uh, wanted to go with the request. First, it is to approve a new preliminary plat for Ranch at the Peak subdivision, and that is to remove the requirement to pave Roundtree Road and remove the requirement to build a trail on the west side of the subdivision from the old preliminary plat. This is a vicinity map showing the location of Ranch at the Peak subdivision. You can see Fort Valley, Highway 180. It's right north of there, sort of in the middle of that north area. And uh, right before you go out into the forest. And this is an aerial photo showing Ranch at the Peaks. At this point, all three phases of Ranch at the Peaks have been approved for final plat. So everything's approved for final plat. And now they're going back to change the preliminary plat, actually to, uh, to apply for a, a new preliminary plat to make some changes to that original approval. And this is a copy of the preliminary plat for Ranch at the Peak subdivision. And this is this is some background on it. Uh, this original application that is to modify those conditions at the time uh, was processed as an amended subdivision preliminary plat in 2002. That was SUB 2737. The commission did hear that case. I believe it's in December. Uh, and they recommended the board approve this application. However, when it got to the board and it was moving forward to the hearing, it was determined that an amended subdivision preliminary plat was not supported by the subdivision ordinance. And that's something the county has done for literally decades. But at that time, uh, the the board, the uh, they, they indicated to us that we could not process it that way. It had to be processed as a new subdivision preliminary plat, not amended. So that's what we are doing now. Um, and also along, along that process, uh, we also have been working with the applicant uh, to improve the existing Ranch at the Peak subdivision roads and that would be sort of in lieu of paving Roundtree Road. These roads were not ever accepted for maintenance by the county. And if they made those improvements, then the county could accept those for maintenance. Um, at this point, we're working on that. We're still working on, on how that would work exactly moving forward. Uh, some of the paperwork for doing that. So it's not clear at this point if this case will be ready for a hearing next month. We'll see if we can get that done in time. With that, I'll take any questions from the commission. Mr. Short, this is Chair Tavares. I am not, oh, Commissioner Wilson, please go ahead. Sorry for the delayed response there, getting my clicker ready here. Um, Mr. Short, I wonder if you could tell me who they are when you're talking about they said that an amended uh, plat app wasn't acceptable. So whenever uh, something goes to the board of supervisors, it goes through the clerk's office, and then it gets uh, through various reviews, uh, like legal review, for example. And at that point, the clerk got back to us and said that uh, they did not, there was, there was not a provision for an amended subdivision preliminary flat in the subdivision ordinance, and that we would have to reprocess it as a, a new preliminary plat. So did that have any impact on all of the previously amended subdivision plats? Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Wilson, it actually, it actually doesn't. I mean, at that point, we have subdivisions that are on the ground. They've been final platted, lots have been sold. So I, I would say those subdivisions have been vested, legally vested. And that, that they would they would not go back at that point, Noah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Best. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I seem to remember that uh, the issue that I had with this case was that um, Roundtree Road had a dust problem and a noise problem. And I understand that we can improve it. But do we have any plans to do any fencing 
or in some way mitigate the dust issue that the, the folks directly on Roundtree Road have to deal with? Um, Commissioner Best, we have not discussed that. Uh, staff has not discussed that. And part of the reason is that it's not really in the subdivision. Uh, it's outside the subdivision on the jurisdiction of the uh, Forest Service. So that was not something that, that has been planned or discussed moving forward. Have you noticed this in the neighborhood? Do the, do the neighbors know what's going on? Not not yet, not at this point. Uh, there was There was actually a sign that was posted for the board hearing. And mm -hmm. honestly, I went out there and I got a big piece of paper and put canceled across the across the posting once I found out that the board would not support this going forward or the clerk wouldn't. Well, I hope that we'll give the neighbors uh, notice so they can chime in on this. Oh, yeah, they um, it will be noticed in the normal fashion. OK. Uh, and uh, the subdivision ordinance requires everyone within a thousand feet to be noticed just like last time. So that's yeah. everyone inside the subdivision and within a thousand feet of the boundary the subdivision. So that's a lot of people. That'll do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Best. Mr. Short, I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. So, Mr. McNeely, if you could please move to item number two. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, item number two is AM 23001. We have this on your study session. We wanted to take the opportunity, we, honestly, with a light study session, um, being that we had this uh, ordinance drafted um, to discuss uh, updates, so it'd be an amendment to the zoning ordinance. We want to discuss these updates to the lighting section of the zoning ordinance with you. However, um, this will not go to public hearing um, with you next month um, because uh, we have a study session, or excuse me, a work session scheduled with the Board of Supervisors on this item um, uh, in August when the board gets back from their break. So I'm going to share my screen now. And, uh, and show you all a little little PowerPoint uh, to kind of orient you to some proposed uh, to the proposed amendments wholesale change to the lighting section of our zoning ordinance. Is everyone um, seeing my PowerPoint presentation now? Yep, we can see it. Okay, and there there was a copy of the um, of the new drafted um, ordinance in your packet. We were able to get that uh, um, get the drafts uh, complete with um uh with that amendment and out to you so this this was a great opportunity to at least get in your packet um get you all familiar with it see if you have any questions on it have any input on it um, before we do our work session with the board um, in august so section 4.3 of the zoning ordinance uh currently is the outdoor lighting section will remain the the outdoor lighting section um, However, this will be a wholesale change um, to this entire section, and, and we'll explain why this is a, a complete uh, removal of the old section 4.3 and a complete update. So unlike some of the other zoning ordinance amendments that you've seen over the years, no, like the one you saw last month, it's not. this isn't a si simple strike of, of some words or some sentences or paragraphs and change. This is a, this is a complete change. Um, so... Uh, the city of Flagstaff has already updated their exact version of this ordinance. They are, for all practical purposes, identical. Uh, of course, uh, Flagstaff, um, the city of Flagstaff, the county, and then many stakeholders uh, from what might be referred to as the dark sky community, the local observatory community, um, worked with uh, the Naval Observatory um, and Camp Navajo a couple of years ago to do the JLIS, the Joint Land Use Study, and updating these lighting ordinances for both the city and the county um, were recommendations that came out of the, uh, the JLIS. Um, so the city took the lead. They've held, they actually held um, a public open house. Uh, they had the ordinance posted at their website and they got very, very little interest. Of course, the city of Flagstaff has, has significantly more commercial development uh, that is affected by the lighting ordinance than the unincorporated county does. 
Um, they have much more of a lighting impact uh, with the commercial development in the city of Flagstaff. So it really was appropriate for them to take the lead and, and get this adopted first. Um, also a recommendation of the joint land use study was uh, to create a shared lighting specialist position between the city and the county. That position has been created um, as recommended by the, by the joint land use study. Uh, and, and that person is in place. And as a matter of fact, uh, um, the person holding that position, Janice, um, is currently processing the lighting permits for, uh, for Coconino County. So we're already relying on this position and it made all the more sense why, um, why one specialist between the city and the county on, uh, on outdoor lighting, doing both the permitting and the, and the code enforcement on it, uh, would have one consistent ordinance um, between the city and the county to work with. So uh, great recommendations that came out of a good deliberate planning process um, of the, uh, the JLIS. So when we look at, um, at significant changes, noticeable changes, um, kind of at the broad overview level from our old ordinance to the new lighting ordinance, the most significant one is that we're reducing three lighting zones across the county to two. Uh, and this is being done by eliminating what currently exists as zone three. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the lighting zone concept, um, lighting zone one, the most restrictive, is the zone that is within 2.5 miles of four observatory locations. Those observatory locations are the Lowell Observatory, uh, that we're all familiar with on Observatory Mesa, um, the Naval Observatory, which sits uh, just west of the city of Flagstaff, Road and Crater, um, which is which is an essentially an art installation observatory, um, which is uh, quite a distance to the northeast of the city of Flagstaff, and then the Discovery Channel Observatory, uh, which sits off of Lake Mary Road. Uh, southeast of Flagstaff. Those are the four identified, and our GIS system uh, clearly identifies where those are and even draws out this 2.5 um, mile radius out from each of those. Um, everything within 2.5 miles of each of these observatory locations is zone one, the most restrictive. Zone two is where you go out to 2.5 miles from each of those locations. And zone two is everything that is beyond 2.5 miles from those locations. Zone two, of course, is a little less restrictive than zone one. Zone three, under our current ordinance, is everything beyond seven miles from those four locations. The, the proposed um, ordinance update would eliminate zone three. And in the case of what the city has adopted, um, the city has already eliminated zone three. Um, we got plenty of time, which is which is one of the reasons that uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to discuss uh, this ordinance update with the commission this evening. So are there any questions while I've got this slide up on the concept of zones one, two, and three and eliminating zone three? Um, uh, oh, uh, Mr. McNeely, this is Chair Ontiveros. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a question, but I am going to let Commissioner Wilson go first. I believe I saw his hand first. That's going to be followed by Commissioner Best. And if they haven't asked my question, then I will follow up at that time. So go ahead, Commissioner Wilson. Sorry about Got my hand up and then couldn't unmute. Sorry about that. So zone two now is everything except zone one. Yep. Is is that correct? Yeah, abs correct, absolutely. The entire county. So Page is in zone two. Correct. Um, although the city of Page, inside the city limits of Page, do not fall under our ordinance. They okay. have their own their own. Uh, yeah, I, I was using it as a geographic reference. Yep. Yep. Something yep. Um, over a hundred miles away. Yes. Why, yep. why are we regulating lighting a hundred miles away from these activities? It, that's that's a good that's a good question. Uh, honestly, across the entire county, um, these locations, you know, go to the to the most restrictive zone one, uh, but across the entire county, and and I think we have some of this uh, enshrined in our 
in our comprehensive plan, just valuing dark skies are, are just very valued across across the entire county. So um, for all the reasons any in in the in the purpose statement, you know, kind of some of the preamble to this ordinance that talks about some of the benefits of um, of uh, dark sky preservation. So that that would be the logic. Um, so you know, part of it is you know the most restrictive zone is is to protect these observatories. Um, but then across the entire county, eliminating zone three um, and, and becoming a little more restrictive with the rest of that, uh, what was formerly zone three is now becoming zone two, is just for the values of, of uh, the dark skies, um, which even up in, I know up in Page, um, there's a there's um, regular uh, star party um, events that take place out on Navajo Bridge. Um, so I think embracing some of that um, uh, um, some of that visual benefit uh, is is something that that uh, that a lot of the community seems sees value in. And so, do we believe that now that we have incorporated the entire county of Coconino into um, Zone Two, um, that a single um, lighting enforcement officer is going to be able to to even real you know have any hope of in, in, uh, enforcing these rules? Absolutely. And and uh, actually, we've got, uh, I failed to mention, we've got Mark Stento, uh, who's our code enforcement officer with us, our code enforcement supervisor. Um, mm -hmm. And Mark formerly held the lighting specialist position. So uh, Mark, if you're with us, uh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. And just following up on your explanation of, of our regional dark sky goals, um, the, the health and environmental impacts of LED lighting, specifically the short wavelength light emitted by modern LEDs, um, is, is rapidly becoming something of an environmental crisis as efficiency of LEDs uh, continues to evolve. Um, the county, as well as the Grand Canyon, which have taken initiatives to eliminate light pollution and become a, a dark sky park, as well as other regional federal areas, um, are attempting to become essentially dark sky sanctuaries um, in order to limit these health and environmental impacts as well as preserve astronomical interests in the area. So it's not just about proximity to um, uh, observatories, not by a long shot. Um, and insofar as enforcement is concerned in the county, um, uh, with the exception of lighting, we are primarily complaint based now. Uh, Janice uh, does do evening work and will in the future, just as I did, be doing lighting audits in these regions. Um, in the past, I had traveled to Page, and while they are incorporated, I'd help them review their existing lighting code and uh, help enhance their enforcement of it. Part of the directive of that position is to travel to the far corners of the county um, and not just pursue enforcement. Uh, but pursue outreach and education. So it is something that we plan for. It's not off the cuff. Uh, we are able to reach out into the farthest areas of the county. Does that answer your question, Chair? Or excuse me, uh, Mr. Wilson? Um, it, it does, but I, I question still whether th there's any hope of success here because you know, I live here in Timberline. I, I don't need to drive more than half a mile to find half a dozen um, gross violations of the current lighting code. Sure. They're all here within, you know, relatively close distance to the observatories that we're trying to protect. Yep. So I, I'm having a hard time believing that um, adding the entire county to that is going to have any any hope whatsoever of success. And, and while I appreciate the dark skies and, and understand the support for it, um, I am curious to hear I, I thought I heard you say that the narrow spectrum LEDs are presenting health impacts. No, not narrow spectrum, uh, general LEDs. So light emitting diodes, modern lighting technology, and we're not referring to, to narrow spectrum LEDs that the county requires and the city requires. Those are, those are much lower impact. Those are safer. We're talking about um, your common run-of-the-mill LED, 2700K, 3K, anything above that certainly including those correlated color temperatures, uh, the short wavelength emissions are pretty substantial. When you look at the spectra of light produced, uh, uh, they produce a lot of blue. Um, uh, there's a big hump in the uh, visible wavelength of light produced. Um, it has health impacts on humans and animals, tricks your body into thinking it's daylight. The emissions of modern LEDs, and we are not talking about narrow band LEDs, which the county and the city require 
uh, to in large part abate this uh, uh, have significant impacts um, uh, on our circadian rhythms. They have been linked to cancer in numerous recent studies, and we know they have extremely negative effects on wildlife as well uh, because of a byproduct of uh, the visible spectra of light produced. It's essentially a byproduct of this technology. Um, okay, so it's, it's interesting to me that these LEDs that we're now finding have adverse health impacts are things that have been basically mandated in the past, um, not outdoors, uh, understanding, but in most workspaces. Um, I know when I built the building I built, I, I had to have all LED lighting fixtures. I wasn't allowed to have any incandescent fixtures inside my building. Hmm. So it, it's interesting to me that as we make these changes, we're abs actually having adverse impacts on, on folks' health. Um, and why I think we need to be especially careful as we do this and, and perhaps even limit the, the geographic nature of, of the, or the broadness of our scope so that we don't adversely impact people unintentionally or without any real value. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. Uh, Commissioner Best. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm proud of this. We've been working on this for a long time. I think we are um, sort of culturally ahead of the game here. I know that uh, the city and county just went to a, a conference in uh, Albuquerque and presented. Uh, you know, we are the first dark sky city. The dark skies, we've got 5 million people coming here a year to experience uh, the Grand Canyon, the wide open spaces of the West, and dark skies are definitely part of that. Um, so I, I really support this. I, I have a question about, uh, in particular, uh, residential um, light trespass. Um, now this is a, it's an education process that's gonna go on for years and years and decades and decades. Um, light is, uh, light trespass and dark sky, uh, I would say light pollution is increasing all over the world. Uh, it's one of those things that takes a long, long time, decades probably to, to turn a corner and educate people. Um, I, I have heard from city planners that in the city, light trespass, which is, I, I would generally define that as my neighbor has a bare light bulb that I can see, is something that is against code and can be corrected if you've got the nerve to, <laughs> I suppose, plan A is go talk to your neighbor, plan B is you could make a complaint to the city. Um, so my general question is light trespass and <clears throat> more particularly residential lighting. Um, does this apply to residences? And if there is light trespass, <clears throat> excuse me, can you make a complaint and get it corrected? So that's my question. Um, I'll go ahead and feel this one. Uh, this is this is Mark with County Code Enforcement. So. Uh, the current uh, code it has a uh, very problematic language. The current county zoning ordinance has very problematic language related to trespass, specifically with the use of as much as possible, uh, combining the light to the property from which it originates as much as possible. The um, proposed uh, updated ordinance and the current city ordinance modify that um, uh, to all outdoor light fixtures, including motion sensing lighting, shall be located, aimed, and shielded. So the direct illumination from the fixtures shall be confined to the property boundaries of the source. Now, from a real world enforcement standpoint, it can be challenging. Um, we went through this back and forth with um, Chris Lugenbuehl and um, uh, we were considering uh, illuminance standards um, along with the, the Zen, then zoning code manager at the city um, for measuring trespass. And the, the, the summary is that we would need something quantifiable in terms of evidence and would have to be something well above ambient levels. So if you had improper shielding, that would be the easiest way to address it. 
Now, the challenge here is we have a lot of existing non-conforming properties in the county with lighting. Um, a lot of people don't change their lights. Now, technically, when you change a bulb out to an LED, um, it constitutes changing the entire light, but we don't, we don't really rigidly enforce that because, well, frankly, it'd be very hard to do. But what that means is you may have someone with uh, uh, an, uh, uh, a legacy incandescent fixture um, with an exposed bulb that may not be unlawful by itself because it was at the time it was installed, it was lawful. Um, uh, now you're forced to deal with a trespass complaint via an illuminant standard. And again, that's problematic. So the nuances of, of enforcing trespass um, can be a bit tricky. The, the short of it is I would want an egregious case before I'd want to take it in front of a hearing officer and press for a citation. Um, and we're talking probably um, one or 10 locks, I would say, would be roughly the minimum I'd want to get at well above ambient levels. And that's probably more detail than you wanted. Does that answer your question, um, Commissioner? It, it does in a way. I mean, a, a lot of this is a long, long-term educational process where neighbors aren't, aren't even vaguely aware of what light trespass means. But I think over time, especially as we are working on new developments, um, you know, new construction, uh, as the word gets out, uh, you know, and yeah. what what you said sounds reasonable. You know, no, nobody wants to be that jerky neighbor who's lighting everybody up. Well, and <laughs> no pun intended, because their lights are too bright. But uh, at the same time, we want to make progress toward dark skies because it's it's a great value in our county it's great well, value everywhere but in particular in a county like ours and to further so yeah clarify, that, that kind of answers my question well and, and to further clarify we 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 generally approach these with a a friendly contact and an awareness which is why we had some materials per the mis grant specifically developed to address this um so we can make that contact and educate you know nine times out of ten in these situations um and most of the time that 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 at least allows for some level of abatement. Yeah, and that's that that's totally appropriate. I mean, as as Commissioner Wilson is is expressing, you know, if we push too hard, we're going to get pushed back. I think most people uh, support the value of dark skies uh, as long as it's done reasonably. We've been at this a long time. You know, we've proven that buildings can be that we can provide. Uh, safe lighting and be consistent with dark skies no question about that anymore um so yeah that answers my question thank you very much thank you commissioner best commissioner ruggles thank you um i would like to say that uh, this is a culmination of over 10 years of effort uh that i and numerous other people have been involved with and I think what we're seeing is extremely well thought out. Uh, it is uh, something that uh, is uh, very closely based on the JLUS uh, study that uh, the Navy did. And um, <clears throat> I think that uh, it addresses the problems that have been identified over the last 10 years. Uh, Mark Stento, and Sot Best and Jess McNeely have um, spoken very clearly relative to this. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, I am only following up their comments on this. One thing I would like to add to this is relative to lighting zone three, the number of people in the Page area, the uh, Greenhaven area, Marble Canyon, who want to have dark skies as a part of the attraction to what they rely on from tourism is very important to those people. And they have expressed this to us uh, over the years. Now, one other thing that no one else has mentioned is the fact that, yeah, so we're out in the far corner of the county and we have, uh, uh, lighting zone three still in existence, and you've got 100 acres and a million uh, lumens of light. 
that constitutes a sky glow problem, which is one of the biggest problems that the Naval Observatory has, along with other observatories. Um, sky glow from Phoenix uh, is a problem, and that is why the Navy, in their study, uh, requested the changes that we are seeing in this ordinance, because the Navy realized that <clears throat> even with changes that we make, to the dark sky ordinance, as Phoenix grows, the problem may eventually get to the, to the point where it will compromise the mission of the Naval Observatory. And if you want a good way to waste taxpayer money, move the uh, Naval Observatory somewhere else. And then the question is, where are you going to put it? So that would be my answer to, uh, well, let's keep zone three. I wouldn't want to do that. Um, other than that, uh, I think I only had one comment, and perhaps uh, Mark uh, could uh, kind of enlighten me on this. Um, on our draft on page 16, uh, the outdoor light output, the next to the last sentence in the paragraph uh, above the four points made uh, states that, uh, in part, pedestrian lighting installed on public rights of way or private street tracks in accordance with Title 13, engineering design standards and specifications for new infrastructure. Title 13 is part of the Flagstaff City Code for lighting. Um, we do not use that. Uh, if we're gonna put something in there like that, uh, I suppose you could uh, identify it as in accordance with the uh, City of Flagstaff uh, Lighting Code Title 13, or just eliminate um, Title 13, uh, Engineering Design Standards and Specifications for New Infrastructure. And I think that uh, I just question having something in there where we are um, uh, saying we'll do something in accordance with part of a code from a different jurisdiction. Uh, now, uh, if Mark could answer that, um, I, I uh, would appreciate uh, at least some input because I think there are several ways of dealing with this uh, that would not compromise what we are attempting to do uh, in the draft. So thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Thank Ruggles, that, the, Ruggles. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Sinto. The Title 13 reference is likely just an overlook on our, and we attempted to go through yeah. and um, eliminate the internal references to city code, um, but but we may have missed some stuff. So I'm, I'm sure Jess and I will review that yeah. um, and go from there. Yep. And my involvement with this has been over a period of 10 years, and mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's why I read this stuff rather thoroughly. I've been uh, very closely... Uh, involved with it uh, from the start and to a lesser degree now that we're at this point um you and others uh, all i can say is you've done a terrific job with this that's a very very minor point the rest um hard to do better hey, commissioner so, ruggles this is jess with staff if you could please email myself and mark exactly where you're seeing that because um uh, both he and I went through this. So if, if you could point us exactly to that point, I, I think I understand, I under, certainly understand the, the point you're making there and, and we can get that fixed. This is uh, exactly, this is exactly why we wanted to hold the study session. Yep. Uh, that, all, so, that, so we can get a, a little, little bit of review. So we appreciate it. And that's exactly why I have it uh, highlighted. And uh, I will send you the text of that uh, with a highlight on it. So there's no problem identifying it. So we'll sincerely, do. Sincerely appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Best, is, do you have additional comments? I, I just wanted to recognize Commissioner Ruggles for the work that he has done over probably the better part of a decade. He and and Chris Luvenbuehl and uh, a number of others in Flagstaff, Mark Stento, uh, have really been on the cutting edge of this. You know, not locally, not nationally, worldwide, and. I think it's pretty darn cool. You know, we're the first, I believe, the first dark sky city. Uh, it's a, a a wonderful value that we represent. A lot of very hard work over many, many years has gone into getting to where we are now. 
And I, I just want to recognize these folks. Uh, thank you very much for your great work. Thank you, Commissioner Best. And I agree with you I, that the recognition is very well earned by all of the individuals that you just mentioned. Um, Commissioner Wilson, your hand is raised. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure whether we were just talking about those first two sections or the uh, entire document, Jess, or are we? So, uh, Trent Veros and, and, uh, and, um, and Commissioner Wilson, we still have, we still have, uh, the slide that I have up right now, we were, we were just pointing out the major change of reducing from three lighting zones to two. And obviously that was worthy of, of a little bit of discussion, but we, we have a little more presentation to give. So if you have questions that are um, coming out of other parts of that draft ordinance we sent you, um, you might see if we cover it and, and then, uh, you know, in, in other, in some of these other. Standing by. We've got a few more slides. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, um, I, Mr. McNeely, this is Chair Tavares. For the record, could you state the major difference between Zone Two and Zone Three? It, well, a absolutely, and and we uh, Zone Zone Two um, in, in our current code um, is you know everything between two point five miles and uh, and then seven miles um, from these four observatories listed. Um, and it is less restrictive. We have another slide that we'll get to where we pull up the charts uh, that actually show the lumens, the lumens per acre regulations um, and the difference between what falls under our current code and what is proposed. So do you uh, think that might help um, uh, pointing out the, the actual quantifiable differences in I lumens sure per do. acre? Okay. Yep, I sure do. So I will stay tuned well, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so just for illustration purposes, this is the city's lighting zone map. And you can see here in the legend, um, lighting zone one, uh, the darker, um, and within the city limits, you see where that is closest to Observatory Mesa, the Lowell Observatory, and then um, the, uh, the Naval Observatory, and then lighting zone two is the entire rest of the city. So uh, again, we already have lighting zones plugged into our GIS available to the public through our partial viewer. Um, and, and if and when um, these updates are done, um, anyone can click on their property in the future and partial viewer and know which lighting zone they are in. Um, other major changes. Uh, we've already referred to it in the discussion, but there's a change to preferred lighting source. Our current code states um, specifically in it that the preferred lighting source is low pressure sodium, LPS. That is a completely obsolete technology. Um, so uh, we, we have been limping along, so to speak, with our existing code by, by basically translating um, uh, to, um, to LED, the more current uh, technology. And of course, as has been discussed, the narrow spectrum um, amber LED. So uh, the updated ordinance um, give, lists the preferred lighting source as narrow spectrum amber LED, and then to get very technical, um, as Mark was, was discussing before, um, that narrow spectrum is between peak wavelengths of uh, 589 and 595 nanometers, as seen on this graph here. And actually, this graph is in the draft ordinance and would go in with the, um, in with the definition section of, uh, of the lighting ordinance. Any change? Any questions on this major change of the preferred lighting source being low pressure sodium in the old ordinance and updating that to narrow spectrum amber LED? Okay. Um, the the next major changes that, that I'll point out is some of the shielding. So this uh, is the Mr. chart. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Commissioner Ruggles had his hand raised. Oh, That's okay. Nothing. Go ahead, Commissioner Ruggles. Yeah, just one one quick comment on that. <clears throat> the uh, recently, over the last several years, the uh, availability of narrow spectrum amber LEDs has increased substantially. Ten years ago, uh, lighting like this uh, that would suit the needs of our lighting ordinance was very close to being something that was made of unobtainium. It just wasn't out there. That's changed quite a bit in the last 10 years and especially over the last several years. So 
just just so you know a little bit about it ahead of time. Thank you. So on with major changes. Um, this is the shielding standards table out of the, the draft ordinance table 4.3B for um, lighting zones one and two. Of course, lighting zone three um, would not exist uh, as proposed in, in the updated ordinance. And Mark, I don't know if you wanted to, if you had any insight on, um, on, on this chart. Um, you know, I, I hate to, uh, to get detailed with a chart on a PowerPoint slide. This was in your, it's in the draft ordinance that was in your packet. Um, but this chart does break down uh, between the two lighting zones, one and two. And then at the top of the chart is your commercial, industrial, and multifamily development. Of course, we don't have near the amount of that type of development in the unincorporated county as what the city has. Um, and, and then that is further broken into uh, the discussion of classes one, two, and three lighting. Those of us who are a little more familiar um, with classes one, two, and three lighting understand what the differences of those outdoor lighting uh, um, classes are based on, based on their purpose. And then you see in, in the chart uh, what has to be FS, fully shielded, um, and uh, which ones are, are prohibited and which ones are allowed. Um, and then further down the chart, we get into the single family and duplex residential. That is what we have a lot of in the unincorporated county. Um, and you see between lighting zone one and two, uh, where you have fully shielded, um, allowed, and then prohibited fixtures. So Mark, any other insight that you could give on, on this chart uh, when it comes to discussing shielding um, within the different uh, land uses, um, with for the different classes of lighting and then um, within the two different lighting zones. Uh, sure, the lighting class is predominantly applied to commercial, um, as, mm -hmm. as you noted, Jess. So uh, the, the current county ordinance is a few generations behind the cities. Um, and the current county ordinance that is being replaced uh, does allow some unshielded class three light uh, in zone two, as long as the luminaire itself is under 2,500 lumens. Um, we have, uh, that's obviously been changed, um, beyond that, the elimination of zone three, uh, where, where the most, uh, unshielded illumination was allowed under the current county ordinance is, is, is going to have the biggest effect. Um, other than that, no, Jess, I think, um, uh, I think, uh, I think you hit most of it. Uh, I should note that on the residential side, um, the current county ordinance uh, does allow a rather substantial amount of unshielded light, especially from motion sensitive fixtures. Um, and that has been eliminated as well um, to the uh, 700 lumen limit you see um, mm -hmm. for single family. So, Madam Chair, I see that uh, Commissioner Wilson has his hand raised. Yes, please go ahead, Commissioner Wilson. Actually, uh, Mark just touched on my question. Um, as we have reduced lighting, um, especially in residential neighborhood areas, um, there's been a concern about safety. Um, and one of the su suggested uh, solutions to those concerns was that motion sensitive um, or uh, motion controlled lighting fixtures were a good solution because they would only activate when necessary for you know, personal safety purposes. And it appears that now in lighting zone one, there's absolutely none of those allowed. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, you're understanding correctly that there's no unshielded light allowed. Now, the problem with uh, regulating motion sensitive units is they can be set to a wide variety of settings. They can set to remain on for an extended period of time. Um, uh, there's, there's no way to really regulate and control that. Someone can change it the minute you walk away. So they there you can't really regulate them. Zone one is within two and a half miles of Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station and the Inferometer. No unshielded light is allowed in those zones. Um, uh, there's no provision specific to motion sensitive fixtures as well for, again, the, the regulatory reasons I mentioned. Okay. I, you know, it says, I'm looking at table 4.3 point alpha. 
um, motion sensing outdoor light fixtures, fully shielded, maximum zero. Um, and I think we're eliminating a, an important personal security potential there that a lot of people um, have been told is, is the alternative to going darker overall. And I just wanted to express a concern. So thank you. Uh, this is Sharon Tavares. I want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. Are we talking about on the motion sensor? Are we talking about lighting zone one or lighting zone two or both? What I'm seeing is zone a, uh, zone one. Okay. So then, if if I may follow up, is it my understanding that motion sensored lighting is still allowed in zone two? That's what I'm seeing on the chart. Okay. And and that's correct, Mr. Stinto. I just I just want to be sure I'm understanding this correctly. To my knowledge, the ordinance doesn't specifically regulate motion sensitive lighting in that it allows more light or unshielded light for motion sensitive units. So there's no specific allowance enabling unshielded motion sensitive units which I think is what Commissioner Wilson is, is alluding to. Um, you can have motion sensitive units, they just need to meet the shielding and lumen requirements for the area as well. So that, that comes back to a shielding question um, gotcha. and yeah. not necessarily a motion sensitive question. There's no reason an unshielded light enhances security beyond a fully shielded light and there's data to back that up. Right, and like personally, I have shielded motion sensored lighting. So um, I would agree um, with you, Mr. Stinto, in that. So I just wanted to be sure that I was understanding this correctly. Uh, so, your, I'm sorry, Chair Antares, could I ask Mr. Stinto one more question then? Because of course. Th this table looks pretty clear to me. Um, if you could refer, it's on page eight of the packet or page four of the lighting ordinance. And it's about in the middle of the page. It says motion, sen motion sensing outdoor light fixtures, fully shielded maximum is zero. So that tells me there can be no motion sensing lights whatsoever outdoors, fully shielded or not. Am I incorrectly reading that? No, and I see that too. That is what the uh, uh, that is what the city ordinance says as well. Now the intent was to not permit exceptions. There's a current exception in the county's ordinance that allows more unshielded light for motion sensitive light fixtures. Um, uh, I can't speak to that specific line item. That in note uh, does have a timer on there. I think that may be um, something in the ordinance that, uh, that we carried over from the cities that was intended to address, again, unshielded motion sensing light fixtures. But from an enforcement standpoint, we wouldn't treat it a treat a motion sensitive fixture any different than a regular fixture in the sense it would still have to meet shielding requirements. Well, and, and this one's saying fully shielded and still zero. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. We'll, we'll look at that. Okay, I, I, it, it would seem a fully shielded motion sensor fixture that has a five minute timer should be authorized even in zone one for security purposes. Assuming it meets shielding requirements? Um, fully shielded, right. And lumen cap requirements. And that may be where the concern is, the lumen cap requirements. I need to look more closely at what the, uh, and I was involved in the um, in the development of this code, but I, I, uh, I don't recall that specific, specific component in there. So we'll have to look at that a little bit more closely there and see. But I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Okay. And this is Chair Antaveras. And um, thank you, Mr. Stinto, for... Uh, recognizing that clarification needs to be brought to that because I do want to underscore the point that Commissioner um, Wilson is making regarding the safety issue. I know that we have all acknowledged it, but in these very rural communities, specifically the Red Lake area, one that I'm talking about, um, we do need, I mean, you, you do need some lighting because there is there's no street lighting in the city of Flagstaff. Um, you know, you have street lights. You you have light coming from other sources, but in these very rural areas, uh, 
um, you're pretty much in some areas, you're, you're your only light source. And I will say that fully shielded motion sensor lighting uh, is, is a safety issue. And so I don't want to see that eliminated in any way. So I will just leave it there. Go ahead, Mr. McNeely. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and I went ahead and uh, forwarded the slide. So we were here discussing shielding standards, um, but then uh, thanks um, Commissioner Wilson for, for discussing 4.3a. We now have uh, table uh, 4.3a from the draft ordinance. Uh, that's in the lower right-hand corner of, um, of your screen here. And, and what we were just discussing right here was um, right here that I'm pointing to with my cursor, the, the motion sensing outdoor light fixtures fully shielded um, and, and showing a zero in, in uh, lighting zone one. So thanks for pointing that out. That's, that's certainly something that's um, good input uh, that we can, we can look back at that. Um, the point Mr. McNeely, of- can I chime in real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, so reading, reading the city's ordinance, and I'm assuming ours reads the exact same way, that the actual, um, so the actual code for single family and duplex light lumen caps reads combined maximum for fully and partially shielded fixtures and fixtures not mounted to the building or, can or canopy, excluding motion sensing out outdoor light fixtures. So what that means is uh, in zone two, the, uh, and I, I do recall this, the, the uh, which would encompass most of the county, there is an additional 2,000 lumens on top of the 5,000 lumen cap allotted to motion sensing fixtures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there is some additional illumination allowed in those areas to address those specific safety concerns. Um, and there is not in, in zone one, you're tied to the 1500 lumen cap period for the property because of the sensitivity of those zones. So that is a correct read on that. And that is how the city's reads, but there's more for outside of that um, in uh, the rest of the county. Um, thank you, Mr. Sinto for pointing that out. Okay. Um, so, so Mark, from what you're saying here is, as I'm pointing with, if, if you can see my cursor on here, um, even in lighting zone one, this, this total cap, this 1500, um, let's see, combined maximum for fully and partially shielded fixtures and fixtures not mounted, um, excluding, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, that is pointing yep. out a, a big distinction between uh, lighting zone two, um, which is the vast majority of the county, um, which could have the motion sen sensing yeah. outdoor fixtures with a 2000 lumen cap. In addition to the 5,000. In addition to their 5,000 year, right, right. Correct. So, so that within that 1500 lumens in zone one, uh, it could be motion sensitive units. I, I don't know if that would be sensible in that particular case, because you might as mm -hmm. well just have a fully shielded unit you turn on at will, but you could certainly have motion sensitive units uh, within that lumen cap. Got it. Um, we would not, we would not enforce on that as long as you're within the 1500 lumens. You're just not allowed additional lumens for out, uh, additional outdoor light fixtures. For motion for, uh, sensor. Excuse me. Um, yeah, uh, motion sensor. Got it. Outdoor light fixtures. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the reason I put this, um, these two charts on one slide here uh, for the commissioners is to point out that table 4.4 that I'm pointing to here in the upper left-hand corner of this slide is from our old ordinance. Um, it's the maximum total outdoor light output standards uh, as measured in lumens per acre uh, or lumens per residence. And of course, we have lighting zones um, one, two, and three in the columns here. So um, contrasting that with the proposed uh, table 4.3 maximum total outdoor light output standards, you can see we've eliminated um, lighting zone three in here and you can start taking a look at the difference in the in the lumen count per acre um, in lighting zones one and two um, for for the different uses, uh, be it commercial or um, or single family. So you know, like in in lighting zone one, total unshielded um, in our old code was capped at twenty five hundred. Excuse me, twenty five thousand, uh, twenty five thousand lumens per acre. Um, proposed in the new ordinance. We see right here the new translation is 17,500. Um, 
pretty significant drop, um, as I understand it, in our, uh, just within lighting zone one, the most restrictive lighting zone, um, uh, with single family residences in the old code, lighting zone one, you were limited to um, 10,000. And I think, Mark, this is 10,000 um, per, uh, it's per residence, um, not per acre. Um, and then when we, um, when we look at uh, the proposed updated code, it's a little bit different, um, but the combined maximum total for single family residential is um, dropped from 10,000 to 1,500. Um, we don't title it as per residence, but rather um, per lot or parcel. Um, so that's that's kind of relative. Uh, you know, some some of the some of the differences in um, in maximum output between the old chart and the new chart. Any questions um, or discussion on Jason, uh, on this if, one? If I can elaborate on that too, yeah, to, I'd like to note that during the development of the city's code, uh, that that 1500 lumens was certainly based on the extensive development that's going on in the zone one area, especially around yeah. the Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station. Uh, but that number was uh, very specific to the data developed um, um, by Fred and company with the uh, with the Navy uh, in terms of what they would need to reduce it to um, to uh, keep illumination levels under control uh, around Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station specifically, mm -hmm. um, a large portion of which is, is, of course, in the city as well, or at least a portion of which is in the city. So it's not arbitrary. Um, that was uh, that number came from came from the Navy. OK. Any other insight, Mark, um, before we take questions here on on these two charts? Um, there, there's some differences to a certain extent. It, it feels a little bit in some cases like measuring apples to oranges, um, but we, we can try to make it apples to apples as much as possible here on on basically translating. Hey, what's what's the change? What's yeah, the impact? so so you'll notice the uh, low pressure sodium specification in the existing commercial uh, code. Uh, yep. You also notice that a substantial amount, basically all white light um, uh, at either 6% or 3% LPS, uh, or, or excuse me, uh, unshielded uh, was, was permitted in zones two and three respectively. Um, and uh, all non-low pressure sodium or non-amber was permitted in zones two and three. Obviously we're eliminating zone three, so that's irrelevant, but zone two, um, all class two illumination uh, has to be uh, narrow band amber, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there is a limit on the amount of white light available on those parcels as well. Um, but again, that's that's predominantly based on illumination class. Class one illumination allows for white light over entryways, over public eating areas, et cetera. Um, uh, so the, the code does allow for white light in areas where color rendition is needed, but basically requires a narrow band amber, and we know LPS is an antiquated technology and no longer being produced at this point, does uh, require narrow band amber for all general safety and security applications. Um, and that's, generally speaking, perfectly fine for, for, for those purposes. Um, so I hope that clarifies somewhat. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, your hand is raised. Thank you. I, uh, I, Mark, I, I understand you said, well, we wouldn't enforce no motion sense lights. I'm sorry to go back to that one. Um, if we're not going to enforce it, it shouldn't be in the code. It, this is our opportunity to make it correct. And, and I would encourage you to, to review that. And uh, I, you don't need to respond. That's just my thought. Um, I, well, no, I'll clarify. I, I was saying that I, if they, they were within their 1500 lumens, we would not care whether that was a motion sensitive unit that was producing that 1500 lumens or not. Um, there, it, it, it would okay. be irrelevant. Uh, Except the chart a, says zero. There could be a footnote added perhaps to clarify that. Yeah. Yeah. Zero okay. means zero to me. I'm just saying we could, you know, we could clarify that. Um, second of all, okay, so we're, we're going to go to all narrow band and we're going to go to um, about one eighth of the allowed light in zone one for a residential property. Um, and we're eliminating the opportunity if we have an auxiliary dwelling unit on that same property for additional lighting for that particular facility, right? 
if I'm understanding this correct? Uh, yeah, there wouldn't be additional light allowed for an ADU. Is that what you're saying? Right. Right. Does that, that doesn't make sense to me that if, if, if a primary residence on a property needs, and, and that's what we're basically saying here, at least 1500, or we're, we're allowing up to 1500, which is a huge cut from what's currently allowed. And then we're saying, well, wait, no, you, you got to cut that in half too, if you have an ADU. Um, I, I question whether that is, is a reasonable expectation. And I, I understand the importance um, of the Naval Observatory. I, I have a top secret clearance and I have been an end user of their product, but I, I think there has to be some balance here. And I'm concerned that also requiring the narrow spectrum LED lighting in residential um, situations, uh, have, we, have we looked at what the difference in the cost for that requirement is to an average residence, and has that been factored into any of this decision making? Is that data available for us to look at? We're not come up requiring narrow spectrum amber for residential applications. Um, that's that's for commercial class two lighting specifically. Um, so there's there's no narrow band amber requirement. Now that being said, um, phosphor converted amber and narrow band amber uh, fixture availability. Uh, as I believe Commissioner Ruggles suggested prior, has, has increased substantially. And, um, you know, I have phosphor converted amber lights at my place. Um, they're available for a couple dollars a piece online. Um, those run to about 2200K. Um, there are some additional restrictions in some city developments within zone one that's outside of our, our scope here today. Um, but in that particular case, they are using phosphor converted amber. But to be clear, the lighting classes and the narrow band amber requirement are not relevant to residential properties. Um, insofar as the uh, illumination on um, single family residences is concerned, um, mostly where, and it, it, one, it's very important that we're consistent with the city in this because we share a lot of zone one with it. And it's important that when you cross the street, the standards remain the same. A lot of where this is being applied is new development in the area. The city and the county will be working with building division to ensure uh, new builds meet these requirements. Any lighting that is in that area in zone one in any area, but in, right now with this conversation, zone one, that has lighting that meets the current code will be allowed to continue to have that lighting unless, unless they significantly update it. In that case, they will have to meet that code. Now that, um, you know, like I said, you know, that that number was determined based on the development that was going on um, in, the, in that zone to protect the Naval Observatory's mission. Um, we, city didn't have a lot of pushback on it. They're enforcing it. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I have much more to say about it other than that, but I certainly hope that answers some of your questions regarding the spectral restrictions or lack thereof on residential properties. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, this is Jess. Um, uh, no other questions on this slide on the maximum output change. Um, we're going to move on to discuss a little bit of, of uh, the permitting process. Um, we would be updating our permitting process to align with the city. Uh, kind of updated, more detailed worksheet, as, as I understand it. Um, uh, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with, with the details, um, there is a separate lighting permit required for commercial development, okay? If you are building a commercial building um, and you got outdoor lighting, which actually would be required by code for your, for your entryway, your exterior entryway into a building, um, any, any commercial uh, development um, is going to require a separate lighting permit. Um, now, that is different from single-family residential development, which, of course, is the vast majority of what we work with in the unincorporated county. Um, when you build a new single family home, um, you don't get a separate lighting permit. Um, however, as has been pointed out, you are still um, required to conform. You're still required to comply um, with, uh, with, um, with this ordinance. Um, that's gonna be a lot easier to work, to work with on, on new builds. Um, we know where our, new, our high new build areas are. Um, in both the city and the county, um, it, particularly in zone one. 
um, and and mo many of those developments are already um, working within um, uh, you know trying to be as dark sky compliant as possible. Um, so we will be working with our with our building uh, division and with our building inspectors uh, for field checks as these new as new residences get built um, that we can advise on, uh, even though they don't require a separate lighting uh, permit for their single family residence in the county. Um, we will be working with the inspectors to ensure what gets installed actually meets the code. So any questions on on the permitting process um, that will get updated uh, to align um, with the city and and with this with a uh, with a new code. Uh, Mr. McNeely, this is Chair Tavares. What is the reasoning for a separate lighting permit required for commercial um, as opposed to none for a single family residence? Um, Madam Chair, that's a good question. I think that's the, the county had never required a separate lighting permit for a single family residence, um, although the lighting code could always be enforced. Uh, I think it's it's a matter of, of a little more simplicity for single family development. Um, when we know with commercial development or any non-residential development, you think of like a, a church or a, a school parking lot, they're typically going to have lighting associated um, with any of those those non-residential developments. So you anticipate more outdoor lighting with commercial development um, and, uh, and uh, developers, builders, architects, engineers um, uh, are, are when they're doing um, designing and, and, and building of a commercial project, uh, that's, that's a bit of a norm that, um, that they expect in our county and, and certainly in the city as well. Um, Mark, any other comments you would give on on that on on why there's no sing, why there's no uh, separate lighting permit required for single family residents from from your perspective? Oh man, it'd be like getting blood from a stone from single family residents. We don't expect <laughs> residents to understand um, the permitting process. The permitting process requires cut sheets, lumen calculations, site maps, um, stuff that is very common for commercial development. Obviously, uh, the the impact is also a hundred to one. Um, mm -hmm. if you're looking at, at hundreds or a few thousand lumens on a residence versus hundreds or millions of lumens on a commercial property, even, you know, the few that exist in, in Coconino County. Um, so the scope is vastly different. Uh, we don't want to burden residents with the cost and the, the duty to do that. We just want them to do their best to comply. Um, commercial also, because of the scope, the permitting process allows us an additional check uh, where we can perform an inspection before issuance of a certificate of occupancy in the case of new development, um, or we can establish a record of the existing lighting. So if lighting gets changed, and the reality of the commercial exterior lighting world is that lighting gets changed on a whim, um, LEDs may last for five to 20 years, the diodes themselves, but the drivers behind them last maybe one to three. Huh. So LED lighting is changed out frequently uh, because of those components um, failing. Um, they change hands, et cetera. New lighting permits required when they come and replace the lighting. So um, that's that's the long version. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ruggles? Yeah, I'm going to add just a little bit of a comment to that. Um, if anyone has any question about the, uh, the amount of lighting that residential uh, contributes to this, <laughs> That was identified in the study that the Navy did, which is a part of the JLIS study that uh, is out there. Uh, it's a simple matter of uh, pulling that up and reading it, and you'll find out that it's, just as Mark said, it's a very low percentage uh, from residential lighting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Commissioner Ruggles. Mr. McNeely, um, it is about a quarter after five right now. And I know that you indicated that we're not going to be hearing this case, um, what, sometime until after August. Mm -hmm. And we still have items left on the study session. Absolutely. Do you think that there might be a good breaking point that maybe we can say, okay, we're leaving off here on, on this draft and pick it up at another study session. So we're still timely in completing the study session prior to the hearing? Absolutely, Madam Chair. I only had one one slide left, and oh. um, I can I can email this packet out. The, the only the only discussion of this slide 
was uh, just like everything under the zoning ordinance. If you were permitted at any point in time as legal, you 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 retain your legal non-conforming use rights. And then we have the triggers in here on this slide. Uh, it, broadly, generally speaking, um, on on what would require uh, fully con conformance of a property to the new standards. At what point do they have to conform to the new standards? Um, but I can email this out to the commissioners. Um, I would welcome individual replies uh, um, back to myself. Um, and of course, I'd be sharing them with Mark. He, he's he's much better at the details on this than I am. Um, as we as we look to make some make some tweaks, make some edits based on input here um, to uh, what we can put in this draft ordinance before we get it to the board of supervisors for their work session. And of course, we would uh, we would bring it back to the commission um, at least once more for another for another work session um, based on on the comments we got this evening. So any okay. any other parting shots? There's not much left in your um, in your um, study session agenda, but any other parting comments on on this item? Commissioner Wilson, go ahead. I have a number, and I'm not going to give you them all. <laughs> in okay. The respect to everyone's time here, um, but Jess, you just said previously permitted lighting remains legal. Yet yep. on page 15 of our packet, item number two says non-conforming outdoor lighting shall be subject to, and this is another example of section 3.13. Um, shall not be used after May 1st, 2006. So there's okay. a section in here right now that directly right. conflicts with what you just told us. Um, so that'll have to be looked at. And I look forward to the next time we hear this, I'll keep my markups handy. I've got a number of more questions. Thank you. Well, Mark, that's, that's one we'll have to look at it. It's the magic year of 2006. Special year. I think that was um, uh, that was a reference to an old mercury vapor lights. Yeah. They were they had a they had a sundown um, in an early version of the code, and that probably just didn't get cleaned up. Okay, um, Madam Chair, if if you like, um, we can move on now and uh, and wrap up the rest of um, of your study session. Yeah. Why don't Why don't we do that? Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here of your study session agenda. Um, thanks for thanks for the discussion. That was um, th this really was a, a a targeted opportunity. It just coincided that that we had gotten some staff work done on the draft and had a light study session, anyways. So appreciate um, the opportunity to um, to get that out to the commissioners and appreciate the the thoughtful comments and and, and look forward to a lot more. Um, I would point out next on your study session agenda. That we have two conditional use permits listed here um, that we see right now as being eligible for administrative renewal. Um, were there any comments or questions from any of the commissioners on item number one here, CUP 2329, or item um, two, CUP 2330? Uh, Mr. McNeely, as the managing uh, member of case number C or the of the property owner, specifically Red Lake LLC, for CUP 23029, I will have to recuse myself from any comment on that one. Okay. And I have no problem uh, administrative renewal with number two. Those are my comments. Commissioner Wilson? Um, I guess tonight is the night of, of uh connections or, or non-conflicts here um, in CUP 23030. I am the lease or of the 40 acre parcel with the exception of the cell tower site that is subject to this particular CUP. Um, I have, I, I control the rest of the property other than the 75 foot perimeter around that particular cell tower. And I did check with county legal earlier today and it is not determined to have been a conflict of interest. So. I will um, do an informed opinion as a commissioner, not as an individual. Okay. So um, I realize, Madam Chair, you're recused on, on the one, but I see no other hands up um, uh, wanting to discuss either one of these um, admin renewals. So we'll move on on your agenda. Um, moving up to our department update. Uh, first thing that I would tell you on a department update that is not listed on your agenda is that um, Marty Hernandez, who you all know well because you get a lot of information from her, um, may well, uh, strong rumor, uh, may well 
be retiring at some point here in the near future, which we which we all aspire to at some point here um, uh, in a happy, healthy state. And her replacement is now Charlene Slaughter. And Charlene is with us actually working, sitting right with Marty and, and helping Marty run the meeting this evening. As a matter of fact, you all got a um, an email from Charlene earlier today, and you can anticipate um, uh, more interactions from um, from Charlene in the future as she will be taking over uh, these duties that um, that Marty's done so well in the past. But we're not saying goodbye to Marty yet. Um, that'll we'll have a we'll have opportunity to do that in the future. Marty's going to be with us for a few more months. We were very fortunate to have have a little bit of overlap. Um, so welcome to Charlene and um, and uh, Marty. We're we're not saying goodbye yet. So, uh, Madam Chair, any commissioners, um, uh, any comments on our uh, updating of uh, um, um, so a few little changes on our our administrative staff? Uh, no, this is Chair Aunt Tavares, and the only comment that I would make uh, would be to, on behalf of the commission, uh, welcome Char, and we look forward to working with you. And glad, Marty, that you're going to be around for a little bit longer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And with that, Mr. McNeely, let's go ahead and continue through the rest of the items. Okay, so Madam Chair, um, item one here is reminder, uh, you all see this every month, uh, that we continue to partner with the Route 66 Brownfields EPA grant. Um, we will highlight here that uh, any applicants, if there's anybody on the meeting or if any of the commissioners are aware of any potential applicants, um, they need to apply for this grant uh, by August. Um, it's coming up on, on us pretty soon here, August of 23. Item number two is, is your monthly reminder that we continue to work with the City of Flagstaff on the Flagstaff Regional Plan. Um, and and um, I believe we are in the process of uh, getting the what will become an advisory committee together for that regional plan. Uh, of course, uh, Melissa is, is our, our primary point of contact for the Flagstaff Regional Plan update, but several others of us um, also participate um, with that effort as much as possible. And the third item here is that um, we do continue to work to update our comprehensive plan. Um, of course, the Board of Supervisors approved the public participation plan for the comprehensive plan update on May 23rd. Uh, most of our work right now is going with what's called the core planning team, which goes across the entire uh, the entire county organization staff. So um, all the other departments across the county uh, that have representatives with the core planning team as we gather some data and do some analysis. And again, um, Melissa Shaw is the is the project manager and the lead for the comprehensive plan update. Any oh. questions from any of the commissioners? I see uh, I see we do have one hand up on those three items. Nelson? Yeah, go ahead. I, you know, I'm the uh, all about the let's keep things brief. So I, I'm, I would like to suggest to the staff and committee that perhaps these um, staff updates like this could be as detailed as necessary in the report. And we could ask if anyone has any questions, if sure. not, could, um, save some time perhaps um, since, since basically we're reading what's on the piece of paper. Thank you. Good recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Wilson. Uh, Mr. McNeely, go ahead and hit the Board of Supervisors update, please. Okay. Just a quick update. Um, uh, on June 13th, the board approved AM 22007, the med medical marijuana hours of operation as recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission. So that is now an approved amendment to the zoning ordinance. Um, we also want to let you know that ZC2214, uh, that was the Greenhaven zone change uh, that was recommended for denial by the Planning and Zoning Commission, that was withdrawn by the applicant, so that will not go to the Board of Supervisors. Um, any questions from anyone on, on items before the Board of Supervisors? Seeing none, Madam Chair, um, I would then get us up to uh, Commission Staff Roundtable and wanted to let everyone know congratulations to commissioners Williams and Ruggles. Uh, they were both reappointed as of yesterday to the Planning and Zoning Commission. 
uh, up to June 30th of 2027. Um, and I uh, wanted to see, just give the opportunity here, in addition to any other roundtable items, if anyone, um, if any of the commissioners had any additional feedback on the APA planning official training videos. Mr. Okay. McNeely, I'm not seeing any hands raised or no, uh, Commissioner Best. Yeah, uh, Jess, would you stay on? Absolutely, yeah, I can stay on. Okay, then if there's no other questions, comments at this time, uh, why don't we take about a five minute break and we'll start the hearing at 5.30. Okay. Uh, Jess, you hear me? I hear, yeah, I hear you perfectly fine. Uh, it looks like if I, so commissioner best right after i said i hear you perfectly fine now now you're coming across garbled so now i'm not hearing it uh, let me try to call Yeah, so, Commissioner Best, I, I hear you. I, I, he, I can hear you a little. It, it is a little broken up. Yeah, I'm definitely not uh, not hearing you. I, I could hear it when you said, can you hear me? Um, uh, amazingly, that's the only thing I've been able to, to hear you say, Commissioner Best. Um, it sounds like, sounds like when you, yeah, that, maybe that's a little better. Can you hear me now? Wow, I hear you perfectly now, yeah. Okay. Um, we only have six commissioners, is that correct? Correct, yes. Uh, okay. Commissioner Walsh, um, she actually messaged to, uh, to, our, to our staff and she had to drop off and we do not anticipate her to come back on. So um, appreciate you being here for quorum. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yep, you're fine. All right, I will do my very best to hang in here. I'm just having a, I'm in my uh, sister's house on San Juan Island. Oh, wow. Uh, up in the north of Seattle. So it's, my computer is telling me that I have a lot of uh, internet connection, but I, I lost you guys for a while there. So okay. um, I will do my best to stay with you. Well, whatever position you're in right now, um, we're, hearing, we're hearing you perfectly fine. Don't move, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm okay. going to move very quickly and go uh, take a very short break and I'll be back. And this should be a pretty short one, right? You Just one case. Yep. Yeah, that should be easy. Okay. Appreciate okay, it. Thanks. thanks. Stop. Tell the orc is high for us, will you? All right. <laughs> hey, hey, Jess. I'm sorry. I have to be yeah. Mean, you got a sec? Um, yeah, I got a sec. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't trying to be rude or anything, but those items um, in this in the agenda there they're they're very detailed and, and descriptive in nature just the way they're included there yeah so you know just asking if anyone has any questions or or updates on it might save a, a few minutes um, to work on the stuff that we've got here so absolutely yeah thank thanks for the recommendation
They're amazing color. In fact, they are beautiful. Colorist. She's a colorist, right? Isn't that like something? Sat, just so you know, you're not muted <laughs> right now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't say anything really bad. <laughs> Commissioner Commissioner Wilson wanted you to say hello to the orcas. Yes. <laughs> I would love you know, last year when we were up here, we saw easily 25 whales. Uh, we had a whole pod come in. this year. Uh, I haven't been so lucky, but uh, it's a beautiful place anyway. So that you realize that's under unincorporated San Juan County, um, and we used to have some staff here who had worked for them. Oh, really? Well, yeah. 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 I, I try. I try to tell them how cool our county is and try to shape them up. So. <laughs> It would be a neat county that the whole county is over a series of islands. You can imagine the uh, oh. the confusion that, according to my sister and family, it takes years to get a permit here. Same problem we have, you know, nobody can afford to live here. Yeah. yeah. Except they're very wealthy. And they can't, can't go to Winslow, you know, get off the <laughs> island. You have to take a ferry. All right, Mr. McNeely, this is Chair on Tavares. It is 5.30 now, so I am going to call this evening's meeting uh, to order. I'm going to start by reading the meeting rules and procedures. So welcome to the June 28th, 2023 meeting of the Coconino County Planning and Zoning Commission. Cases will be heard in the order they appear on the agenda. Following the staff presentation, the applicant and or the applicant's representative may address the commission. As an applicant, if you agree with the staff report and have no additional information, please feel free to keep your comments brief. Any relevant comments are welcome. Following the applicant's presentation, I will make a call to the public. If you wish to address this case, please state your name and address. We ask that your comments be limited to three minutes or less. Comments must be relevant to the case. Please address all comments to the commission. No matter how strongly you may feel about the case, all comments must be polite and courteous. After all interested public have spoken, the public comment portion will be closed. Discussion will then take place amongst commissioners. Decisions of this commission regarding any zone change or preliminary subdivision plat approval are referred to the Board of Supervisors as a recommendation. All other case decisions are binding unless appealed to the Board of Supervisors. If you disagree with the commission's decision, you have 15 days to appeal. Please contact staff at the Community Development Office for appeal procedures. Due to the virtual nature of this meeting, I will be doing a roll call vote of the commissioners to ensure accuracy for the record. Please mute your speakers and turn off your camera. Also, please do not use the comment function for discussions. It is for communicating with staff if you are having a technical problem. With that, thank you for joining us this evening and actively participating in our county planning. The first item on the agenda this evening is the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone would please stand and Mr. McNeely, please lead us. Thank you, Madam Chair. If anyone would like to join me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. The second item on the agenda this evening is the election of chair and vice chair. Uh, I'm going to open it up for the other commissioners to speak at this time. Commissioner Ruggles, you're unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to cut to the chase right off the bat here and make a motion to uh, re-elect Commissioner Ontiveros and Vice Commissioner Burton to the uh, 
positions of chair and vice chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission. I'll second that. Okay, um, I've got a motion by Commissioner Ruggles and a second by Commissioner Williams to reelect Chair Antever uh, to the chair and Vice Chair Burton to the Vice Chair position for the following year. All in favor, please say aye. Commissioner Bass. Aye. Commissioner Burton. Aye. Commissioner Wilson. Aye. Commissioner Walsh. Commissioner Walsh, I, Walsh, I think you're muted. Uh, let's see, is Commissioner Walsh with us? Madam Chair, I believe Commissioner Walsh uh, had to drop off the meeting. Um, however, we still do have a quorum. Okay, so she won't be then at the meeting this evening? We don't anticipate that she will rejoin, no. Got it. Okay, so let me what, knock that off. Okay, Commissioner Ruggles? Aye. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Williams? Aye. And this is Chair Aunt Tavares. And I would just like to tell my fellow commissioners, thank you again for your vote of um, confidence in me. And I hope to serve you well for the following year. So... With that, the next item is the approval of the May 31st, 2023 minutes. If there's no changes or modifications, I'll accept a motion in a second, please. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes as, pre as presented. Okay, I second will that. second that motion. Okay, I've got a motion by Commissioner Wilson and a second by Commissioner Ruggles to approve the May 31st, 2023 minutes. All in favor, please say aye. Commissioner Best? Aye. Commissioner Burton? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Ruggles? Aye. Commissioner Williams? Aye. And this is Chair Aunt Tavares. I also vote aye. The motion passes unanimously. The first item on our public hearing agenda is case number CUP 23-007. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Jess McNeely with Community Development Staff. Um, this is a conditional use permit request for a cell tower in the uh, Kaibab Estates area. Bob Short of our staff is managing this case. I see he already has his screen shared. So Bob, please go ahead and give your presentation. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everyone hear me and uh, see my screen? Yep, we can see you and hear you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This case is the Vertical Bridge Cell Tower, CEP 23007. Uh, in this case, the application, the property owner is the Republic Properties, Inc. of Scottsdale, Arizona. Applicant is Vertical Bridge of Boca Raton, Florida. The representative is Sean uh, Sanchez of State 48 Development Consulting of Scottsdale, zoning CG 10,000. The size of the parcel or the development is a, a 0.23 acre portion of a 6.58 acre parcel. And the request is a conditional use permit for a 120 foot wireless to telecommunications facility. This is a vicinity map showing the subject property. As you can see, this is Ash Fork, which is outside the county, outside Coconino County. You take double, double A Ranch Road up to this uh, parcel uh, in the commercial zone. And this is an aerial photo showing the subject property. You can see the location of the tower, roughly right in the middle of this circle. And uh, as you can see, this, these are the red properties are commercially zoned and the other properties in this area, the yellowish properties are AR zoned. And you can see this uh, large cinder pit right here in the middle covering this parcel and the subject property as well. Okay, first we're gonna talk about some special considerations for a cell tower application. Uh, cell towers are a little bit different. They have a little bit more things to consider. Uh, the first thing is that the determination of impacts from radio frequency 
radiation is entirely within the purview of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. That cannot be considered by the commission. That would include any kind of emissions from the cell tower, any kind of health effects from the cell tower emissions. Um, also, in addition to the findings of fact for a conditional use permit, there are two additional considerations for the commission to consider. And this is based on federal statutes in the Telecommunications Act of 1996. So I put this here so that you can consider this as the, the presentation goes along. Uh, the first one is, has the applicant demonstrated there is a significant gap in coverage? And second, is the proposed tower the least intrusive means of addressing the coverage gap? And I'll talk about this more later as we move along. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of show a definition of each of those. A significant gap in coverage is uh, means that a provider is prevented from covering a significant gap in their own coverage. So if there's a cell tower provider, in this case, the original one would be T-Mobile. Um, are they prevented from addressing that gap in coverage? And least intrusive means, means uh, it requires the provider uh, show that the manner in which it proposes to fill the significant gap in services is the least intrusive means. Uh, in other words, does the site and the design of the tower provide the least impact? And that's based on our zoning ordinance, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But primarily we're looking at the design and the location. Uh, are those both appropriate? Is that the least intrusive means of, of addressing the coverage gap? Okay, with that, I'll move on to the facility. Uh, this tower uh, would provide for co-location and may include multiple antennas in the future, including a microwave antenna. Right now, it only has one, it would only have one antenna initially on the tower. The facility would be enclosed in a 50 by 50 enclosure and that'd be surrounded by an eight foot chain link fence. And that fence would be required to have colored slats to, to match the surrounding environment. So however the surrounding environment looks, that would be the color that would be expected. That's a condition in the staff report. The tower does not meet the 105 foot height setback, but it would collapse uh, within a 75 foot radius per a certified engineer. So our zoning ordinance says that the tower has to be 105% of its height away from a, the nearest property line. In this case, it's only 87.5 feet, which is not 105% of a 120 foot tower. However, if uh, if the applicant can provide this letter from a certified engineer, which they have, then um, that can be waived. So the engineer, basically the certified engineer is saying that the tower would break and collapse within a 75 foot radius. So it would not go across the property line. Okay, Mr. Short, this is Chair on Tavares. And let me just quickly, um, there is kind of an echo. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah, Mr. McNeely, could you mute and let's see if that's what it is. I'm going to mute and go ahead now, Mr. Short, and let's see if that clears it. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, there, there would be no lights installed at the top of the tower because it is less, it is less than 200 feet tall, and those are not required by the FAA. Other lights at the bottom would have to meet um, zone Nord's requirements, and that means they need to be fully shielded and be motion sensitive lighting. And this is the proposed uh, tower color. This is a site plan showing the tower on the site. This is the site right here. This is Buck Drive, and you can see the 50 by 50 foot enclosure with the chain link fence and be the tower would be right in the middle of that. It's about 87, I believe it, it's exactly 87.5 feet 
from the property line here on uh, AA Ranch Road and uh, to measure to the actual roadway. I believe it's about 130 feet. And this is an elevation of the tower. So if you look at the top picture, uh, the, or the top of the tower, this would this is what would initially be installed on the tower. That's the T-Mobile the equipment. Uh, there would also be a microwave. I didn't see a microwave called out on here. But as they go along, uh, the applicant would want others like Verizon, uh, AT&T, and those could all increase the number of antennas on the tower, as shown. This is a coverage map showing the current coverage in this area. And as you can see, each of these each of these little red marks, that, that's a tower. That's the cell tower. And you can see they're, they're along. This is in Ash Fork. This is down I-40 a little ways. Note it, notice that the green area, that's the best coverage. That's what you call over here on this chart, that's commercial coverage. The green area, which doesn't quite match that, I would say, but that would entail a residential level of coverage. The yellow area would entail like uh, the coverage you could get from being in a car. And then these last two here, it looks like, well, at least this last one here is outdoor coverage. So I, I, I do have to say the colors don't always match up perfectly, but you can see that this would be further out in this area. So this would be the location of the tower on AA Ranch Road. And this is the current coverage level. And this is the extended coverage level created by the tower so that there would be more better coverage in this area. And I wanted to give you an idea of uh, what that means exactly. So if you look at it from this perspective, now the, the interesting thing, I'll go back one, is that I don't really see anything except the green expand on here. So that's that's all that the applicant is showing at this point is just an expansion of the screen, which is the commercial level. So if you look at that commercial level again, the green, it would go out about two miles, a little spotty. It looks like it goes across a canyon right here. So it'd go about two miles to the west and north, about a mile to the south. And it's very important that it would cover, this is the KEW Volunteer Fire Department. So it's very important that it covers that fire department uh, to provide emergency services and, uh, nine, and 911 service. These are some photo sims the applicant has provided uh, showing the tower from a variety of locations throughout the community. Uh, this is from Verde Drive. It's about 1,450 feet from the tower. You can see it's not very visible. This is on the west side. This is also on the west side. It's at 1,400 feet. You can see it back in here. The vegetation is kind of covering up, so it's not very visible again. This is from Mesa Drive, which is on the east side. It's quite a bit closer. It's at 1,030 feet. You can't see it over here. You can see the tower over there. This is from Fountain Drive also on the east side of the tower. And you can see it. It's a little bit more visible right there. And this is from Charm Drive, fairly close to the tower at uh, 750 feet. And this is uh, coming from the north, traveling south on uh, AA Ranch Road. If you can see right here, that's Buck Road right there, right by the tower. So the tower would be right in here. This is at 300 feet. And this last one is from right on site. So it's like 30 feet from the tower. You can see the, the antennas on top, the initial antennas that would be on top right there. Okay, uh, I want to talk about conformance with the zoning ordinance. As the commission knows, uh, after reading the staff report, uh, it the zoning ordinance does have 
what we call preferred facilities and disfavored facilities. So in this case, the preferred on the preferred facilities list, the tower is ranked fourth. That's because it's a new site on previously disturbed areas such as a cinder pit. This is literally on a cinder pit or, or near a cinder pit. It also ranks sixth as a new tower, 100 to 175 feet in the commercial zone. Now note that one is the most preferred and 10 is the least preferred. So surrounding the commercial property in this area is AR zone properties and they would rank nine out of 10. So it's a very low ranking to get off of those commercial, off of the commercial zone property onto any of the AR around there. This tower is also considered a disfavored facility. That's a C because it's very close and actually kind of adjacent to residential areas. It's right across the, the road from residential areas. And this is just kind of for your information, this is the list of preferred facilities. Number one being co-location on existing towers, so you don't have to build any more towers. Then there's the uh, concealed or camouflaged facilities. And then down here at the bottom, there's a new tower. And these are disfavored facilities. Some of them were located within, you know, scenic corridors, such things. This one is a C because it's adjacent to or very close to residential areas. Now, these are the factors leading to the selection of the site. Uh, first of all, it meets the applicant's coverage objective. That's T-Mobile. Uh, this is an area that doesn't have very good cell coverage from at least some carriers, so uh, it meets their coverage objective. Uh, the site is close to double a ranch road. This is the most important thoroughfare in the area. So as you know, when you're traveling down a road, you like to have uh, cell coverage. Um, it's located in a commercial zone on a disturbed site. As I said before, it's a cinder pit. Um, other commercial properties, if available, would be equally impactful to residential areas. And I'll, I'll show you a map in a minute and show you how that would kind of play out in this area. The surrounding AR zone ranks lower on the preferred facilities list. As I mentioned, it ranks ninth. Other areas on the property would interfere with the owner's business operation. They have a cinder pit on this property and they needed to be in a place that wouldn't interfere with that. That cinder pit may expand in the future. Uh, it provides coverage for the 9-11 emergency services. That's KW Volunteer Fire Department located about 0.4 miles from the site. And this area does not contain tall pine ponderosa pine trees and was considered a, was not considered appropriate for a monopine. So as the, as the commissioners who have been here for a while know, almost all of the towers that the county does are monopines. They're fake pine trees uh, that would stick out here quite a bit since there are none around. Okay, so this is the, uh, the zoning and development near the proposed tower. You can see again, the proposed location of the facility right there. Now note that if you're, if you're looking for a commercial property to locate on in this area, uh, then this, this is very disturbed. So there's not much place here for it. It's an active cinder pit as far as I know. Uh, so, you know, it'd be nice to put it up in here, but that's in, in the bottom of the cinder pit where the owner is is uh, operating his business. Uh, if you located it here, you're close to residential. If you located on one of these, that's assuming they were available for sale or for lease. Th that is also closer to residential. This is has already has residential on it, I believe. It's also close to residential. If you move it back in here, it's also close to residential. So. This is kind of one of the only places that we can see where you could uh, you could develop the tower in this area. In terms of citizen participation, the applicant notified 74 property owners within a quarter mile of the subject property and uh, invited them to a meeting on December 21st of last year. Nine people attended the meeting and provided comments. 
concerns included visual impacts of the tower, health concerns, effects on property values, emergency uh, generator noise, and several other concerns described in the citizen participation report. So that's included in your uh, packet. So you can uh, look at what, you know, what has been said, what citizens had uh, commented on. Uh, the applicant and staff has received additional comments. Those are also in your packet. One comment did support the proposal, and we did get another comment yesterday. Actually, you got it. You got it today. And this is the quarter mile owner notification area. The red line is a quarter mile, 1,320 feet from the subject property. And as you can see, it all of these green outlined properties were notified of this application. These are the findings of fact for a conditional use permit. I've, ad I've addressed those um, in the staff report and also here, number one is that the proposed location of the conditional use is in accord with the objectives of the ordinance, the zoning ordinance, and the purpose of the zone in which the site is located. As I've said before, a cell tower, a wireless telecommunications facility is allowed in the CG 10,000 zone with approval of the conditional use permit. Number two, that the proposed location of the conditional use and the conditions under which it would be operated or maintained will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare, or materially injurious to properties or improvements in the vicinity. The response to that is that it ranks four and six out of 10 as a preferred ranking, preferred location and that it is actually a disfavored facility because it's very close to a residential area. Finding number three, that the proposed conditional use will comply with each of the applicable visions of this ordinance except for approved variances. The project does comply with the ordinance. And if you looked at the ordinance, the uh, wireless telecommunications section of the ordinance has 3.9, section 3.9, it, it does cover a lot of the aspects of cell towers without requiring waivers. And finding number four, that the proposed conditional use is consistent with and conforms to the goals and objectives and policies of the general plan or specific plan for the area. There is no area plan here. So these are the applicable comprehensive plan policies. First, the uh, first one encourages enhanced wireless infrastructure that supports public safety purposes. Obviously it's real close to a fire station. So it provides that service, emergency service. Uh, the second one, utilities infrastructure shall be located in a manner sensitive to the community character and environmental and scenic resources. So that one, uh, that one may conflict in this case because it is real clo very close to a residential area. And as I said before, in addition to the findings for a conditional use permit, there are also findings based on federal statutes. So basically what federal statutes would say is if the commission determines the application does meet the findings and believes the application should be denied, there are additional issues to consider based on the federal statute. So that th this is just in case, obviously, if the commission uh, can make the findings and approves the tower, this would not apply. But if the commission cannot make the findings and decides to deny the tower, these are additional considerations. The first is the application may be denied if the applicant does not demonstrate there is a significant gap in coverage. So if the commission does not think that's been demonstrated, it can be denied. However, if the applicant has demonstrated there is a significant gap in coverage, the application may only be denied if the commission determines the proposal is not is not the least intrusive means of addressing the significant gap in coverage. Is the location and the design of the tower 
Uh, is that not the least intrusive means of addressing the cut gap in coverage? And uh, if uh, if the commission decides this is this is correct, then uh, that we would need something specific in the record uh, to address why they think this is not the right location or the right design. And this is a, a cell tower application evaluation chart that was in your packet. I'm not gonna go back over this again, uh, but we can discuss it somewhat if the commission would like. And with that, if the commission can make the findings for a conditional use permit and can meet federal requirements, staff recommends approval with the conditions in the staff report. And with that, I'll take any questions from the commission. Thank you, Mr. Short. Um, this is Charon Tavares. Commissioner Ruggles, I saw your hand first. Please go ahead. Then okay. I saw Commissioner Best and then Commissioner Wilson. Uh, you will follow Commissioner Best. So please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I would uh, like to know if there was anything in the ordinance specific to um, communications facilities such as this about the uh, sound level at the property line. Uh, I um, was rather remiss in not checking that prior to the meeting tonight. So if uh, Mr. Short could uh, tell me, uh, I would certainly appreciate it. I, in my memory says we didn't put that in the, uh, that part of the ordinance, but if I'm wrong, I'd sure like to know it. Commissioner Ruggles, I was kind of thinking the exact same thing when we went by that a minute ago. So it it is possible. I don't I did I do not remember that being in the ordinance, and there may not be a condition as well. So we can certainly add that. Okay, thank you. So Commissioner Ruggles and, and Bob, uh, Madam Chair, uh, yeah, I'm scanning through the ordinance now. The the ordinance that that is something that got added into the ordinance um or okay. other sections but this section of the ordinance okay. uh, does not address a um a uh noise control or limit thank you um mr mcnelly will uh commissioner ruggles we we can add that condition thank you very much appreciate that commissioner bass go ahead Thank you. Um, the last time we had a case where we had a, a tower adjacent to uh, private property like this, residential property, we went through quite a process. Uh, this was in Oak Creek Canyon, the last one I remember, maybe seven years ago, six, seven years ago. We went through quite a process of uh, examining where else a possible tower could be located. And I, I know that uh, Mr. Short looked at a few of the residential properties or commercial properties just in this immediate location. But my question would be, is there, are there other potential locations uh, that would give more or less the same coverage? Obviously the coverage is, of this is gonna go a lot farther than just the immediate vicinity uh, that we're talking about here is there high ground somewhere else that would be less in the middle of a neighborhood uh, so i wonder if any analysis has been done along those lines well commissioner commissioner best i think the the point in this case is this is a uh, pretty specific location where the applicant is looking to uh, create additional coverage so this is their location. Um, I mean, you could go, there are many other commercial areas throughout Kaibab Estates West. Uh, they chose this location because, well, first of all, it's close to the fire station. So they get the emergency coverage. Uh, it's, as you can see on this map, it's a, a commercial area. It's right on AA Ranch Road, which is the thoroughfare uh, going through this area. So, you know, if you pull up Kaibab Estates West, there are many other commercial zones you could put it in. Obviously, if you put it in one of the residential zones, 
that's uh, that's that's not a preferred site. That that's number nine on the list. So I think based on the the coverage that the applicant was looking for, this was the location. There wasn't really anything else. I mean, you can always raise the height of the tower. You can do many things to get better coverage. Uh, but this was this was the location they were looking for. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Wilson. Um, Commissioner Wilson, before you begin, um, I'm going to keep the meeting in order here. And I see a hand raised from an individual that says iPhone. I don't recognize that as being a staff or a commission member. So I'm going to ask that that hand be lowered because this uh, time of questioning is strictly for commissioners to ask questions of staff. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. or Commissioner Wilson. Thank you. I, um, Mr. Short, you, you talk about 9-11 coverage for the fire station. I, I'm not clear. I'm sure they don't dispatch from that volunteer fire department. But what are you referring to when you say 9-11 coverage for the fire station? Well, actually, well, I'm, I'm speaking of emergency calls, which, which would be able to get to the fire station easier if you have better cell coverage here. So I'm not sure exactly what you mean. It depends on the kind of emergency, I guess you're speaking of. Uh, but uh, oh, so it isn't. It's not really related to the fire station itself. It's improved cell coverage will produce right uh, better 911 coverage. Yes, and they would also have better coverage at the station itself. They would uh, they would be able to get calls in e easier themselves if there's more coverage here. We had the same issue with uh, with Oak Creek, uh, with a cell tower application down there where uh, they, okay. they did. I'm just trying to understand. For them. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand why the fire station needs um, better cell service. It, 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 it's a volunteer fire service. It's not manned all the time. Um, and the dispatch isn't done by them anyway. So I, I, I wasn't clear on how that was a factor here. All right, um, echoing Commissioner Ruggles' comments about the generator noise, um, looking at the cut sheet for the generator that's being um, proposed, there are um, different levels of acoustic enclosures for that generator. And so I would suggest that um, the requirement for the noise restrictions um, include referencing that so that the appropriate level acoustic enclosure is used to ensure that kind of wh whatever we decide the number is, DB at the property line. Um, and then you mentioned that there are, right now it's a particular carrier's coverage and so there'll be cell antennas which are usually um, long or, or tall, narrow, um, you know, vertical arrays of an antenna, but that microwave antennas may also be mounted on this. <clears throat> and my, my experience is microwave antennas are not nearly as unobtrusive they're they're large round usually painted white kinds of antennas is, is that the case here mr wilson i haven't seen the actual microwave antenna um and, or the size okay. of it we can wait until the applicant maybe could address that um because i think that plays a role here in, in what we're looking at aesthetically and impacts on the neighborhood so, all right, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. Uh, Commissioner Ruggles, I see I your hand raised again. <clears throat> yes, I was going to uh, add to uh, Commissioner Wilson's comment about the generator and the noise. Uh, I, I was going to speak to that and provide some numbers uh, that tell you what that could look like during the commission discussion. And I would just soon leave it until then. Okay, thank you, um, Commissioner Ruggles. This uh, is Chair Ontiveros. Mr. Short, could you go back to the uh, propagation map, the current one? Uh, 
Okay. Um, was there, you know what, you had a different one that showed where the fire station was that you pointed out. Can you pull up that slide? Okay. Um, So right now, currently, it is already in a green service area. Am I correct with that? Uh, not, not within the commercial serve, not this green service area. If you look, at, I'll go back to previous ones. You go back to the actual current, notice there is no green commercial service area around this area. It would be located about right here. So it no, it is not currently in that area. Okay, and was I also, go, go to the slide that you just had it on, please. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, no, you're fine, you're fine. Uh, go back to, there you go. Was I, In your presentation, did you say that the red dot showed current cell tower locations? Yes, the, these are cell towers. Okay, so where, so then am I correct that there is already a cell tower there? No, no, I'm sorry. These are cell, these are current cell towers. This one is the proposed one. The proposed, okay, right. so there is not yeah. one there right now. So right. The, the next question may be more for the applicant um, because looking at the legend, there is the commercial and the residential, the two shades of green. Do you know what the difference is in the service between the commercial and residential? I don't know, except for these numbers down here, which I, I am not super clear about. Uh, that is something the, the applicant is prepared to make a presentation so they can, they can answer those questions. Okay, then why don't we do that? I'm not seeing any other hands raised from the commissioners at this time. So uh, I'm going to ask if the applicant or the applicant's representative would like to address the commission this evening, please. And please state your name and address for the record and then go ahead and address. Hi, Tammy. This is Shannon McRae. Project manager with State 48 Development Consulting. Um, our address is 14301 North 87th Street, Suite 105 in Scottsdale, Arizona, 85260. Um, I just wanted to say quickly, thank you, Bob, for that detailed presentation. Um, and thank you for going over all of the components of the site. I really appreciate that. Um, there were a couple of items that I wanted to touch on in regards to the coverage map. Um, we can have an RF engineer provide more of a detailed breakdown of the difference between the residential and the commercial coverage as shown on this coverage map. Um, so I'd be happy to, to get that detailed information from the RF engineer as these reports were provided by T-Mobile's radio frequency engineer. Um, as shown in this current coverage map that Bob has up currently, there is a lack in coverage in, in the sense that the yellow portion that's shown there is, is service that's only um, accessible in a car versus residential and commercial. So this is something that T-Mobile and Vertical Bridge were hoping to address with this new tower here. Um, there were a couple of other items as well that I wanted to touch on. Um, I know that light was mentioned as one of the potential concerns. Um, there will be four tech lights installed on the um, equipment pad for the initial carrier T-Mobile, but those will be sh shielded and they will be motion censored. So those will not be on at any given time. And we can make sure that those are um, up to all of the information in the code. Another item that was mentioned as well, I know of concern was the microwave. We do have final CDs that show the microwave antenna, it's a small antenna. Um, so I'm happy to share the drawings to, to show you what that would look like. And we can also create photo sims um, to include with, with our BP submittal um, or to send over to the commission as well if that would be preferred. This, came, this request came at a later date after we had submitted our original zoning drawing application. Um, so we can get that ordered as well. Um, as mentioned, 
as Bob mentioned, this area was selected as there is a gap in coverage here um, that was identified by FCC broadband standards and vertical bridges, as well as T-Mobile School here is to address the coverage gap that you're seeing on this current coverage map right now. Um, we did determine that a monopole would best suit this area as there are overhead power lines here. And as Bob mentioned, there really aren't many tall trees in the area. So we felt that a monopine would stick out rather than blend in. Something that we had discussed with Bob um, on the side was, was doing the tower, that gray color to try to blend in with the surrounding area um, and minimize the impact to the surrounding community as much as possible. Um, trying to think of if there were any other questions that needed to be addressed here. Um, I know obviously with that zoning map as well, it showed that those surrounding parcels are zoned AR. Um, as, as Bob mentioned, those areas are not preferred for a new cell tower, which is why we opted to go with this, um, this property here that's zoned commercial. I'd be happy to share the drawings or presentation that we have prepared. Um, however, I do think that Bob did a very good job at showing all of the components of the site, as well as um, a detailed presentation of, of the different components going on here. I'm sorry, this is Chair Aunt Tavares. Ms. McCrea, I neglected to unmute. Um, does that conclude your presentation to the commission at this time? Um, I would be happy to, to share if, if that's okay with you. I can go ahead and share the um, aerial view of, of the site on the CDs and as well as the elevation of kind of what the size of that microwave antenna would look like. Um, as noted, I don't currently have photo sims showing exactly what that will be. Uh, as it will appear on the tower, but we are happy to get those if that is something that um, you guys would like to see. But if it's okay with you, I can go ahead and share my screen to show that. Uh, yes, if you would like to present, go ahead, please. Okay, perfect. Okay, are you able to see my screen here? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, so something that um, Bob mentioned is that T-Mobile's antennas will be installed at this initial rad. Um, they'll be installed straight here. We do have the goal with this new facility to allow for multiple carriers. Um, as shown on that coverage map, there are other cell towers in the area, but with these cell towers at this height, it allows for co-location um, abilities for multiple wireless carriers. So this will reduce additional towers needed for the area here. Um, this microwave antenna is proximity of size to the antennas that will be installed on the physical tower itself. Um, and again, we're happy to get photo sims of what that might look like over to the commission for supplementary review if that is something that would be preferred. Um, I did actually also just remember another comment that was made regarding sound um, there will be eventually an emergency backup generator that will be installed at this site, um, something that individual carriers typically do in the event that there's a power outage. Um, they can rely on this emergency backup generator to provide power to the site. Um, this will only cycle once per week for a total of 15 minutes, and we can make sure that it meets any sound requirements as required by uh, the jurisdiction or the code. Um, so we're happy to accommodate that as well. And I think there may have also been um, an additional comment on our on our photo sims. Um, the Clean Link Fence compound did not show the, the privacy slots. So that is something um, that we have discussed and we will make sure that that is also plotted for privacy as shown on these drawings here. And we'll make sure that the color map is um, whatever is preferred by the jurisdiction to blend in with the surrounding environment. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. McCrea. Does that conclude your presentation at this time? Uh, yes, ma'am. At this time, I believe that Bob did a great job of, of explaining all of the other components, but I'm happy to answer any additional questions that anyone might have. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Wilson, I see your hand raised, so why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Um, I have a, a question for you, Ms. McRae. I'm looking at the T-Mobile coverage uh, map on their website, and it shows that the area that in question that we're looking at here is all 5G coverage. Um, that, that's on their map right now. So I'm, I'm questioning the gap that's shown in the RF engineers drawings um, don't seem to coincide with what T-Mobile is advertising on their website as far as coverage in this area. Can you address why there's a difference? Um, so I would have to look at, at the page that you're currently viewing. Um, the system that T-Mobile uses to create these propagation maps is an internal system, um, and they they also determine what we call search rings, um, which is where they identify there's a need for improved coverage in that area. So I would have to see specifically what you're looking into, um, and I, I'm happy to follow up on that, but this comes directly from the radio frequency engineer for this specific area, noting that there is a gap in coverage. Um, so I would be happy to follow up with the radio frequency engineer at T-Mobile to get some further explanation on that. But um, at this time, that was the, the, the current coverage that is shown in the area, as well as the improvement with this new tower. Okay, just for your reference, it's T-Mobile.com slant coverage, slant coverage dash map. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. Mrs. Uh, Ms. McCrea, this is Chair Aunt Tavares, and I'm going to ask Mr. Short to put up the slides of the current coverage and the before and after the slides that you have, Mr. Short. I do have those up as well, um, but if Bob, if you have them up currently, um, either way, I can share them as well. Oh, yeah. Um, Either I don't care. Either could could pull it up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, but <laughs> Thank will, you, Bob. I will know. <laughs> Thank well, you, Bob. Uh, no, no, not that one. The okay. one that actually has before and after. Okay. I think it's forty-seven and forty-eight, maybe. Okay, this is the before. Current, but it's coverage. actually labeled before. Um, oh, okay. You want the, the? This is actually the same map. I just labeled a little different, but this is ex this is the same map. Okay. Uh, you know what? Hold on a second. Let me. Uh, I don't know why my screen will not toggle. Okay, Bob. Specifically, will you pull up page from your staff report forty seven, page forty seven and forty eight, please? Okay. Let me get off of here and pull that up. Here we go. Okay, there we go. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. The before first. Okay, so we have the before, and we see where the proposed tower is going to go. And in that area, it is pretty much surrounded by the residential green. Okay, so now go down and pull up the after. Okay, and so it appears to me that it, it, it leaves it very much the same. It just makes it a darker green. I, I wish we could see them like both on the same. Is there any way to see them at the same time, the before and after at the same time? 
I don't think it would be easy to do that. I could try okay. and see if I can pull up. I can pull up the slide, the slideshow. Oh, that would be too different. I don't think I can do that actually. Okay, and that's okay because I can pull it up. I actually have it on my computer, and so I'm looking at them. I see the before and I see the after. I can get. I can kind of fit them both on, like a look at them kind of at the same time, and. I do see that the proposed tower would would add some more residential green and it would add um, some commercial green according to the legend. So my question to um, Ms. McCrea is define significant gap in coverage for me. Yeah, of course. Um, so the way that they identify um, a significant gap in coverage is is based on it is based on the colors of the map there. So obviously, this is showing what the coverage after will look like here with the um, the increased green area showing where the tower will be placed um, versus on the initial coverage map. It just has that yellow color initially identified, showing that there are gaps in coverage. Um, there's unfilled bins driving through this neighborhood where you'll lose service and you won't necessarily have the capability to contact emergency services, um, something that is really important to Vertical Bridge as well as T-Mobile and any other carriers that might co-locate that everyone in these areas where they're looking to place new towers has access to those emergency services as well as has you know, fast, reliable service as well. Um, but they look at these areas where there is a significant gap in terms of um, unfilled bins and areas that, you know, are showing that there's a lack of coverage and they try to address that by placing a new tower. Okay, um, Ms. McCrea, would it be possible for you to pull up a side-by-side, -side, a before and after side-by-side -side, so this commission can, can see that? Because... I understand what you just said. I do understand what you just said, but I'm wondering, I think that maybe I'm wondering what significant is. Because as I look at this, I see, I see that there's already coverage there. So I see that there's not even really a gap. This is my opinion, but I see that there's not even really a gap there right now because it does have the residential green. I will agree that it is turning to a darker green, which is the residential to the commercial. And I still don't understand the difference between those two coverages. Right, okay. Yeah, I, I would be happy to share that. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen quickly. And Madam Chair, uh, perhaps Ms. McCrea could uh, explain the difference in the commercial and the residential coverage. What is, in kind of layman's terms, what does that mean? We can see the numbers on here, but I think a lot of us don't know what that means exactly. Yes, exactly. We can see shades. We can see numbers. But you got to break it down for, for us. What does that really mean? And the, another question that I have is, does the KEW fire department, volunteer fire department, have coverage now? So in this area, there is coverage where the, uh, the fire department is located. However, it is, it's spotty covered there. So with this, this yellow um, kind of area, and I tried to to crop it and zoom in um, as much as possible just in the, the period of time here. Um, I have the two side by side. So this shows the current coverage here. This shows uh, what the coverage will look like after the fact. Um, so this area right here is, is showing and, and it's a little bit hard to see obviously because it is zoomed out here, but with these yellow areas, uh, these are potential areas where there could be loss of coverage, um, you know, driving, you could lose you could lose signal here. Um, there is residential coverage. However, within the residential coverage areas, there are um, 
you know, yellow items as well, which which would mean that there's spotty service. Um, the commercial, obviously, this area is primarily residential. The couple of parcels that are where the tower is going to be placed are commercial, um, and that is, you know, part of how we determined that this parcel would be preferred for for the new wireless facility. Um, however, commercial. Um, service, so to speak, is it's typically stronger. The um, the signal strength is stronger when it comes to to commercial the, the commercial service identified in these areas versus the residential. And this area here in green obviously increases the residential coverage as well as the coverage for commercial. And part of that is that the uh, darker green color, you know, the the improved coverage is is needed in especially commercial areas where there's more residents, um, where there's, you know, a lack of coverage and they need that stronger service there um, versus residential, you know, when it's it's spanned out a little bit, um, it's not necessarily the, the level of, of coverage is not necessarily as important, but due to these areas in yellow here that are showing that there's there are gaps um, that creates concerns for carriers and the capability for surrounding residents to have access to be able to contact emergency services and to have fast, reliable service as well. Okay, so going to the point you made about uh, bringing commercial coverage into a commercial area, uh, it's, it's a cinder pit. I, I, I'm just trying to be real here. It, it's a cinder pit. Um, so this area is really largely residential. Um, Cause I'm looking at the before, I'm looking at even the after and I'm still seeing yellow. I'm still seeing spotty yellow on um, like just to like if you look at both of them side by side and you look at where the proposed tower is going to be and you start moving to the left in a westerly direction they're still yellow um there's still much of that yellow at least if i'm seeing this correctly is still there and i guess go here here's the question significant means what again? Like, I, I hate to keep drilling down on this, but I guess I was thinking that maybe there would be a bigger bang for the buck here with this, with this tower. But it looks like it's just turning it darker green um, on the after. And it is expanding sun green, but I'm still seeing, personally, I'm still seeing quite a bit of yellow um, still in here. Yeah, but so so I can, yeah, and I can kind of speak to that as well. So um, just to, I guess, give an example um, with another site that we have as well, um, what RF looks at when they determine, you know, need for a new cell tower in these areas as they look at items where um, they have customers who whose needs are not being met, um, they have customers who don't have access to E911 services. And in this area, uh, it was identified by FCC broadband standards that there are gaps in coverage here in these yellow areas identified on this RF propagation map here. Um, and so what the coverage objective is and the way that the um, antennas are our positions, um, so to speak. As you can see here, the, they're shooting what they call different rads, um, different um, azimuths. So the antennas are facing this way, this way, and this way, which is kind of why this one has like a little bit more of an impact here versus in this area, uh, their objective was to, to increase and improve coverage to this direction mostly, um, which is why this area is still being shown in yellow versus versus this area here, which had the uh, the coverage and, and demand that they were looking to address. Um, okay, but would you agree with me that there are still yellow areas, like 
even right out of that dark green on the on the after picture right there. Would you agree that that there are still yellow areas there? Yes, that is that's correct. There are yellow areas. Um, are, are you referring to this area uh -huh. here? And, uh -huh. yeah. and even down, Sorry. there's some spotty down. Uh huh. Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, okay. And so again, just to conclude, kind of my question: the fire department, the volunteer fire department, currently does have coverage. I can't speak to the specific coverage um, in that area. I, I haven't haven't gone out there, but um, it, it appears they have some coverage, but it's not a strong signal there. Okay, so the difference again between residential and commercial is a stronger signal. Stronger signal strength, correct? Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to leave my questions there, Commissioner Wilson. Before I open it to you. I'm going to ask Adam O to please put your hand down. This is a time for commissioners to ask questions of the applicant. The public is not involved in this portion just yet. Um, thank you. And Commissioner Wilson, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I'm wondering, Ms. McCray, the antenna ray that's depicted in the uh, drawings that you're showing here, um, completely eliminates any going north. And, and the area to the northeast directly from that tower is the least served in this entire surrounding area. The areas that Tara Tavares was mentioning over to the west, um, when you look at it in Google Earth, you can see topographically are canyons. And so those are areas that that South Tower Height probably can't reach. But the area directly to the north is not. And so I... I, I would wonder, it would seem the least served area is the one being left off of the easiest place to get to from this this monopole. There is no array going towards the north. Can you help me understand why, since that would be a significant increase in coverage from yellow to green or dark green? Um, yeah, so, you know, RF has certain objectives this area here was the objective that they were looking to address this this coverage gap in this body service here um we can definitely follow up with them regarding you know this area here and if there's a potential to increase the coverage capacity this direction um you know the the objective that they advised to us was that this area here is is the area that they're looking primarily to to address okay. that, um, but I'd be happy to, to bring that up to them and, and mention that, um, you know, it looks like this area is underserved as well and, and potentially does require additional coverage to the north. I, I can tell you that making a finding might be easier um, if that were the case. Second question is really, you mentioned E911, um, the enhanced 911 service. Um, can you tell me whether these different colors of coverage on the map reflect whether E911 is or is not available within that coverage area? I can't specifically speak to that. Um, so what? So kind of what the co the colors are um, covering well, is single strengths. I understand that, but E911 yeah. is important so because it's geolocating and 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 reporting your specific location in in addition to some other information. Um, is does this change or enhance the E911 capabilities as a result of this tower? Yes, this would enhance E911 services. Where? It would enhance E911 services to all surrounding residents as well as to the fire department that's located approximately here. Mm -hmm. um, and it would allow for, for calls to be made out to other E911 services in the area, such as fire, police, et cetera. Um, so, you know, specifically this, this volunteer fire department here would improve their coverage, um, but it would also improve the coverage for residents to be able to make those calls. Okay, but it doesn't expand the E911 coverage. E911 is either is or is not regardless of this tower, is that correct? 
it yeah it will expand the e911 coverage for specifically for that volunteer fire department that's located here um but it would be you know in what capacity they have coverage in this moment that's not something that i can currently speak to I guess I'm probably phrasing this poorly, and I apologize. Are there areas shown on this map right now that do not have E911 coverage? So these areas in yellow are the areas where there's body service. Um, it's it's not necessarily, I can't say 100% um, that they don't have E911 services, uh, but the signal strength is very weak in this area, in these areas that are identified as yellow, um, which is creating this need for the improved signal strength for them to have the capability to call. But I, I can't, this map does not indicate how much coverage is, is existing in terms of, of being able to get in contact with them other than identifying okay. the signal strength there. Thank you. All right, do any of the other commissioners have questions for Ms. McCrea at this time? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to open it up to the public at this point. Um, Mr. McNeely, I will ask that you help, that you time each speaker three minutes and that you give a one minute warning so that they know they've they've got one minute to complete the comments and with that i'm going to uh remind the public that as i call on you if you would like to address the commission please raise your hand or unmute i will call on you i ask that you state your name and address for the record and then you will have three minutes to address the commission this evening so with that, would anyone like to address the commission this evening on this case? Okay, um, I see Adam O. Um, Adam, if you would like to state your name and address for the record, and then your three minutes will begin. Go ahead. Uh, yes, yes. my name is Adam Oluchschlager. Uh, I'm at 4272 North Double Ranch Road, which is essentially within 400 feet of that tower. But I just wrote something up I'd like to... Uh, uh, Say it to the committee real quick, and then I'll, 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 say, I'll be done. Uh, hello, I'm a registered contractor, and having installed one of these in the past, I'm against the placement of this cell tower near my property. Based on the plans I've seen here, the structure will be less than 400 feet from two homesteads, one building occupied and the other underway. As I'm sure we all know, cell towers act as lightning rods, not to mention increased noise and light pollution, potential neither of which I want near my property. The entrance for the site is also at a bad bend in the road, which will lead to increased traffic and accident potential during and after the construction for all the homesteads and visitors to the National Forest. I hope this committee will find that the tower needs to be relocated further back on the six acres from the road or better yet, a different location entirely. I'm really excited to now be part of this community. Thank you for your time. Oh, and my, first, my earlier email could be ignored. I'd sent one in and I kind of just covered it. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, would anyone else like to address the commission this evening? Okay. Um, Deborah Guthrie, please state your name and address, and then your three minutes will begin. Hello, my name is Deborah Guthrie. I'm at 4176 North AA Ranch Road. And I, um, I recall that um, it was mentioned that other locations were not looked at, and I'm wondering why some... Um, other locations have not been looked at, particularly on, on the ridges or up higher where more service can be uh, brought to the community. And again, I am also against the, this location. It's, it's in rock throwing distance from my property. So um, that would be my question. And if other locations could be looked at, that would be great. I just think this is a bad location. And it's also gonna be next to, um, the school bus stop and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Guthrie. Um, there is, and Ms. Guthrie, I would like to ask that you put your hand down please now since you have had a chance to speak. Okay, Al D. Seco, 
please go ahead and address the commission and state your name and address for the record. And then I'm going, you will be followed by Joaquin uh, Forster. And Mr. DeKiso, you seem to be muted. We cannot hear you. Okay, okay how's that? Me. There you go. We can hear you now. Yep, state your name and address for the record, and then your three minutes begin. Al Tachico, 3877 Mark Place, which is about a little over a quarter mile from the site. And I say that I talked to months ago, and I confirmed through the news that they are partnering with Starlink. And they told me there's no need for any more cell towers. Uh, number two, we don't want it. It's very close to our home. We already have a person that has seizures and a child. And we don't want this type of technology, which is unproven. It is proven that the perception of the public is that it lowers property values. So I'd like the people that want to put this there to let us know if they're going to compensate us when that occurs and we have property value loss and that's about it we we oppose it uh, we have our own team over right now it's not always perfect but we're on zoom right now and it's working great so we don't need it thank you okay thank you um I cannot, for whatever reason, I cannot pronounce your name pro properly, and I don't want to, don't want to kill it. So, um, thank you for your comments, Al. And I do, I know that in your comments you did bring up health effects, and I want to just tell you that I do understand your concern about the perceived health effects. But as long as the builder of this cell tower is complying with FCC regulations concerning radio frequency emissions. This commission is bound by law not to base any decision on that issue. So I just wanted to let you know, I understand your concern, but I just, for full disclosure, I just want to put that out there. So, um, but thank you for your comments this evening. And, thank you. With, mm -hmm, and with that, I'm going to move to Joaquin Forster. Joaquin, this is Chair Aunt Tavares. If you can hear me, I see you unmuted, which indicates to me that you would like to address the commission. Um, if you can hear me, please address the commission at this time by stating your name and address for the record and then proceeding. Okay, um, Joaquin, we cannot hear you, um, but for the record, I have stated that I see you unmuted and I see that you attempted to address the commission, but we cannot hear you. Mr. McNeely, can you hear Mr. Forster? Uh, Madam Chair, no, I, I, don't, I don't hear anything. Um, is, I don't hear anything as well. Okay, do you have any suggestions because I don't want to exclude anyone from um, this hearing this evening. If if uh, Mr. Uh, uh, if uh, Mr. Forster uh, could um, put in the chat uh, that he's trying to speak or that he wants to speak, um, that would let us know he's indicating. But I, I haven't seen any. Um, yeah, I haven't seen any indication. Um, okay. Can we provide a cell phone number for a phone number for him to call in if his website isn't working? Sure. Um, um, let me ask what uh, Mr. Forrester, are you able to enter anything into the chat to let us know that you are that you're with us?
Okay, Mr. Uh, okay, we do have a response and he is with us. He is there. Um, for whatever reason, we are unable to hear you. Mr. McNeely, what do you suggest uh, the best way for him to be able to address the commission this evening? So, Madam Chair, the, if, if uh, his, his um, system that he's logged in on isn't working, the other option you can try is, is calling in the cell phone number. So um, maybe if, if Marty, if you could paste into the chat there um, what the uh, what the cell phone number uh, is that that could be that you can call into to um, to get into the meeting on a cell phone. OK, Mr. Forrester, we are going to provide you a phone number for you to call in. So please look at the chat and look for that number, please. Okay, Mr. McNeely, I don't see the number being posted for Mr. Forrester yet. Do you? Give me just a moment, please, Mr. Chair. One, yeah, one second, and we will get that. We will get that put in the chat. Okay. Hello. Okay. Oh, we're hearing him now. Oh, you can okay. hear me now? Um, Mr. Yep. Forrester, is that you? Yes, it is. All right, we can hear you now. So please state your name and address for the record, and then uh, your three minutes will begin. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Joaquin Forrester. I live at uh, 4093 North Friday Road, which is within a quarter mile of the tower. Um, I just want to say we don't want it and we don't need it. I don't want the RFs. Um, I don't want the interference with my electrical devices. Um, there are far better sites that you could choose uh, on a prominent ridge line to the east, for instance. Um, I just, I, I don't want the tower there. It's gonna be an eyesore. The RFs are not good for health. I know you already mentioned that you're not, um, taking that in consideration or whatever, but uh, it's it's pretty big issue. Some people get tinnitus from cell phone towers. It's not good. I don't want it. I don't need it. I'm fine without it. And uh, that's my two cents. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Forrester, uh, for those comments. And um, I know that you mentioned um, in your comments that I did uh, state that we cannot um, consider the health effects. So I just wanted to reiterate my previous comments that I had made. Mm -hmm. um, so I am looking to see if anybody else, I'm gonna make another call, one last call to the public and ask if anybody would like to address this commission, please raise your hand or unmute. And I am not seeing any, Mr. McNeely, are you seeing anything that I'm not? No, I am not seeing any other hands raised or anyone else unmuted. All right, okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close it to the public and open it at commission level. Um, Commissioner Best, would you start us off this evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, having in particular, really looked hard at the maps that were on screen a few minutes ago. This just doesn't seem to pass the common sense test. Uh, this is in a neighborhood, although it's on a commercial property, but it's very close to residences. Um, our first finding requires that uh, we be consistent with the comprehensive plan and Part of that is compatibility with surrounding neighborhoods. It's not very compatible. Uh, there are areas, as uh, Commissioner Wilson pointed out, to the Northeast uh, that 
are in the yellow, not the green. This doesn't help. Um, it does seem like a more rigorous uh, search process for a location that would have a higher impact, a higher positive impact on reception and less of an impact on the neighborhood would be appropriate. So I'm always interested to hear what the rest of the commissioners say, but that's where I am at this moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Best. Uh, Vice Chair Burton. Um, at this point, I, I honestly can't see that they've met the requirement to show that there's a significant gap in coverage. Um, I mean, that's, I, I, yeah, I'm of the same mind. Why are the arrays only going one direction? Um, and, and that's, those are, those are my thoughts at this time. Okay, um, Vice Chair Burton, let me ask you this. I'm going to stick very, very closely to our cell tower application evaluation flowchart. And the first, the first thing that we have to decide, um, Mr. Short, I'm thinking you're getting that up there, aren't you? Ah, there you go, right there. The first question that this commission has to answer is this. Does the proposed cell tower meet local jurisdiction, excuse me, local jurisdictions zoning requirements? That means, can we make the findings to approve this? That question has to be answered before the significant gap in, in wireless coverage or wireless service. At this point, Vice Chair Burton, do you feel that you could make the findings to approve this CUP? Let me look at the um, the findings of fact. Hang on. I would say barely, but I feel like I could make the findings. Okay, barely, but could. Okay, so for the first round, um, I'm gonna go ahead and move to Commissioner Wilson next. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, will answer the question with a no. The uh, cell tower does not meet our local jurisdiction zoning requirements because we're having to waive the requirement for the fall distance. And so for that reason alone, it, it clearly does not meet it, even though the engineer's um, explanation says it shouldn't. Um, that's not what our zoning code says. It says it shall not. It doesn't say pending an engineer's interpretation. And I would say that um, the, the second question of significant gap coverage, the, the fact that it fails to cover anything to the north, to me, clearly shows that it is not. So it's my thoughts. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Wilson. Commissioner Ruggles. Commissioner Ruggles, I think you're muted. Sorry, I, I missed that. <laughs> thank you. Um, first thing I have to state is that I did visit the site with Mr. Short. Um, and uh, the uh, coverage that exists in some areas, uh, I had some pretty good indications from my phone while I was out there because I get a notification every time I go in and out of a cell, uh, it's a little spotted. Uh, I can attest to that as it is right now. 
However, there, there are other things to consider. Uh, one, I would really quickly like to address the uh, generator noise. Um, I took a look at the data from Generac. Uh, the generator uh, with a uh, grade two enclosure would uh, produce about 71 dBA at full load, measured 23 feet from there. Uh, that data makes it pretty easy to do an estimate of um, sound levels at the property line and at the closest uh, property line, which would be almost immediately to the west, it would still be 59 dB and uh, dBA. So um, even though it's only running 15 minutes out of a week, um, that still poses a problem um, for some of the neighbors. Um, because there isn't a lot to, uh, uh, well, to uh, mask the sound out there. Juniper and pinion doesn't do very well, uh, re require additional sound uh, deadening to uh, get down to 50 dBA at the property line and a reasonable level across the road. Now, <clears throat> in relation to the findings, um, one of the things that I can't consider is uh, property values. We've been down this road before. Um, can't We really can't consider that. But there's a lot more than that. When I look at the uh, propagation map and look at what is covered to the north, um, then, uh, well, <clears throat> that's quite lacking. I am right in there with Commissioner Wilson on his assessment about that that in terms of uh, finding A, um, that's a problem. Um, I'm, I'm not at all sure I could make finding A in addition to finding B for similar reasons. So uh, at that point, I, I'm kind of interested in uh, other opinions uh, from the uh, commissioners uh, this evening before I reach a final conclusion on this. But in my mind, uh, it's not looking very good right now. If we, if we had a proposal before us that widened the uh, commercial uh, intensity or uh, level of the signal to the north and covered more areas up to the north uh, where it's obviously still going to be spotty, um, that might revise my opinion a little bit. But at this point, this is uh, where I stand. It doesn't look good. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. Commissioner Williams? Um, yeah, I'm kind of definitely on the no side of the fence on this one for uh, many of the reasons that have been expressed already. Um, uh, I think the, the fall distance as a technicality is an issue and I really do not see that it covers a significant gap. Um, so that would be a no. Okay, um, what I'm gonna do is I, I am up next, this is Chair Aunt Tavares and I am up next and I have already made up my mind on this. So I'm gonna go ahead and state my position and my reasoning for it. And then I'm gonna come back through every commissioner and ask for um, the decision and also the specific reasoning. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that rather than saying, I cannot make finding number one, it needs to be followed by, I cannot make following number one because, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, start here and then we will cycle back through the commissioners. Um, again, this is Chair Ontiveros and I'm going to follow the cell tower application evaluation flow chart very carefully. The first question that has to be answered is, does the proposed cell tower meet local jurisdictions zoning requirements? The answer to me is no. And the reason that I say that is is under the findings of fact required to approve a conditional use permit, if we go to number D or number four, it states that the pro proposed conditional use is, is consistent with and conforms to the goals, objectives, and policies 
of the general plan or a specific plan for the area. This area does not have a, an area plan, so therefore we go to the um, comprehensive plan. If you look at a policy six in the comprehensive plan, um, I do not see how a 120 foot cell tower is compatible and complementary with surrounding neighborhoods. And I will say that I do realize that this cell tower is being proposed on a commercial site, but it is across the street from a residential area. It is adjacent to a residential area. So I cannot make the findings to approve this CUP to begin with. So then if we follow the chart, since my answer to that is no, I have to answer the question, does the proposed cell tower cover a significant gap in personal wireless service? I have been looking at these before and after maps for, I, I've spent a lot of time looking at them. And I do not see that there is a significant gap um, that it is going that it is going to cover that. When I think of significant, I think of big and bold, something something more than just a. I don't know. All it really does, from what I've seen from before and after, is it simply kind of darkens the green from commercial to uh, residential, and with that, you get a stronger signal. But I still do not believe that the applicant has met the burden to show that there is a significant gap in personal wireless service in this area. So since my answer to that is no, then I go to uh, the local jurisdiction could deny the cell tower. And that is where I am at. My decision is made. and. Um, that's where I'm at and my reasons for it. So I'm going to come back and we're going to start with Commissioner Best and go ahead and lay out your decision and the reason for it, please. And be as specific as you can. This is Commissioner Best. Uh, I cannot make the findings uh, in particular. Uh, Finding A uh, requires that we be consistent with the objectives of the ordinance, the comprehensive plan. Um, I don't find that this tower is compatible and complementary with the surrounding neighborhoods. I don't see that it uh, closes a significant gap in coverage. And I do not see that there has been a careful examination of other possible sites and therefore I cannot make the findings and I would and my uh, vote would be no. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Best. Vice Chair Burton. Okay, a uh, little more thought um, after hearing everyone else and I'm going to say that I cannot make finding B due to uh, it being a disfavored facility due to its proximity to a residential area and finding D um, because of policy six, it is not complementary to the surrounding neighborhoods. And then outside of that, I also do not see a big enough improvement in coverage to consider it a significant improvement in coverage. Um, so I cannot, um, my, my vote will end up being no on this. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Burton. Commissioner Wilson? I uh, do not believe it meets our zoning code because of the fall radius. And when we get to the gap coverage, I do not believe it covers, it, it uh, addresses a significant gap in coverage. Um, and I think this is why having islands of commercial within residential is never a good idea. And I, so I cannot make the findings. Okay, so the specific finding that you cannot make, make is that 
uh, A, number one. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Ruggles? Hey, my primary problem would be with making finding A, but uh, a couple of other things I'd like to speak to. Um, several other commissioners have brought up the fall radius. Uh, in the past, when we have had uh, CUPs like this, where there has been a monopole in what would be a, a rather restricted area, the engineering firm that certified that it would fall within the uh, requirements of the zoning code has provided the design of the tower that would accommodate that. Now, one thing that I was looking for in the applicant's uh, data was exactly that, uh, a flanged uh, and bolted together tower at a point that would guarantee that the fall radius is what uh, the uh, engineer said it would be. I didn't see that. So I have to agree with Commissioner Wilson on that. Um, that uh, is uh, part of the incompatibility uh, with the zoning ordinance requirements. There's no data to support what is being contended uh, that someone like myself can look at and say, yep, I know what you're talking about and why it's gonna work that way. Uh, additionally, uh, when we get down to coverage, um, there is no coverage to the north. So the benefit uh, is considerably diminished to residents in the area north of that. And as I said before, I know how spotty that is just going around the site. Uh, I know that's anecdotal data, but it's spotty, you bet. Uh, and it doesn't look like there's going to be a big improvement in that. And as such, uh, that is uh, a matter of the lack of compatibility with the neighborhood and uh, what the uh, residents there would get in terms of any benefit from this installation. So that being said, um, I cannot make findings either A or B uh, with relate relationship to the uh, CUP here. So I would uh, not vote. Uh, to go forward with it. Thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. I believe you did indicate that you cannot make findings A or B, and I believe that you indicated that you cannot, you do not find it compatible with the neighborhood. Are you also saying that you cannot make finding number D? Uh, that would be the case this, uh, in this discussion, yes. Okay, so you can might not make findings A, B, or D for the reasons that you have set forth. Okay, is, thank you. That is correct. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Ruggles. And Commissioner Williams. Um, I cannot find um, for finding A, B, or D, honestly. Um, And I, I don't think it's in accordance with the um, objectives uh, of the ordinance and that the location so close to all the residences um, is disfavored enough, certainly, to make me not uh, make that finding B and, um, and D. I mean, there there is no area plan for this area, but from hearing from the residents, if there was, I don't think this would be something that they would have in it. So, um, and that, so that's the first part. And then I also don't see an, any significant increase in coverage. Um, and, I, and yeah, I mean, all everything to the North still doesn't really have much coverage to speak of at all. So, um the coverage increase was is not that impressive so I, i'm a no on this okay thank you commissioner williams and this is chair on Tavares, and i also also already stated my position so with that let's go ahead and move uh 
for a motion for denial of CUP 23007 and a second, please. I would like them to make a motion to not recommend approval of CUP 23007 to the Board of Super. Oh, well, this isn't a recommendation. This is no. that we disapprove yeah, CUP 23007. I'll second that. Okay. Um, I have a motion by Commissioner Wilson and a second by Commissioner Ruggles to deny CUP 23007. All in favor, please say aye. Commissioner Best? Yeah. Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Burton? Aye. Commissioner Wilson? Aye. Commissioner Ruggles? Aye. Commissioner Williams? Aye. And this is Chair Aunt Tavera, CUP 23007. Um, it, the motion has been denied. The final item on the agenda this evening is a call to the public for items not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to address the commission this evening for items not on the agenda? All right, and seeing none, my clock shows 7.14 p.m. and the meeting is adjourned. So good night, everyone. I will, I will see you all next month. Thanks, good night all. thanks commissioners, have a good month. Mm -hmm. good, good night, night everyone. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Mm -hmm.